good evening and welcome to another episode of Cryptid Ramblers podcast. I'm Callum from Essex in the UK and across from me as always is Scott also from Essex. How you doing man? Hello. Yeah very good mate, how's, this? how's things? Good, yes, yeah not, uh, yeah, not too bad at all. Um, has your week been good? Yeah, not too bad, busy with work. Um, yeah, absolutely. Luckily enough, no, no killing of pheasants. <laughs> or of no. any other small animals. No. no, luckily the UK pheasant population <laughs> is uh, going strong this week. They are safe from me this week. <laughs> safe from you and your car anyway, yeah, and your yeah. roof rack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so yeah, thankfully I haven't been um, initiated in any more blood rituals. No. I, I haven't had any more sh- high strangeness or anything like yeah. that, thankfully. Exactly, um, yeah. How about That's you, good. mate? Yeah, not too bad, yeah, again... Busy week with uh, with work. Um, obviously, now everything can open up again. Everyone's got into a panic as to whether their business is insured, oh, yeah. um, and so it's good. It's keeping me busy, and I can keep me head down and whatever. So it's not uh, it's not too bad. Um, Nothing to grumble at. No, exactly right. Um, unfortunately, in terms of high strangeness, I've, I probably wasn't as uh, fortunate and uh thankfully <laughs> well, i'll say thankfully being the operative word you were there uh i was there to witness it. it yeah so i'm not i was there to see up. your face <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sick. which i'm which I'm sure you took great uh pleasure in i can uh, oh yeah after the last episode yeah i did i know you did um <laughs> yeah it was um so it was for those that don't know for obviously the listeners we're recording on a on a sunday um, and we we do our call the Thursday before to basically go over the sort of episode and kind of plan the the timings and everything. And um, so we did, we did so on the the Thursday uh, that just gone. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we uh, we're coming towards the end of our chat, weren't we? And we were talking about yeah uh, visiting uh, Canuck Chase up in. It's uh, something Staffish. that we 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 talk about that quite a lot, don't we? Yeah. Because it's only a good, yeah. it's only about four or five hours away from where we live. And it's uh, we just we just love all the high strangeness that happens over there. So we was talking about how much we want to do experiments and do maybe even do an overnight camp there yeah, exactly. as well. Well, yeah, we were talking about yeah going there, doing a recording from the the woods. Um, yeah, doing, that as well. Uh, doing a, you know spirit boxes and uh, you know other bits and um, yeah. We're just you even of- even suggested. Do actually record an episode there, which I'm, yeah, I was like, it, yeah. yeah, I'm up for that, man. That is so, yeah, that's so fucking cool. No, we should do that with all the ambience, everything. Exactly. No, absolutely. And you're right. It would be, uh, it would be cool. And uh, you know, you you made a joke about, um, you know, you doing the uh, the, the blind uh, spirit block, spirit box, sorry, with the that's right, yeah. VP and uh, being concerned that I would, uh, you know sort of crap me pants Alt and uh, run off and, and leave you and uh, leave me in the middle of fucking caddick chase with a blindfold and ear defenders on exactly yeah and then, <laughs> and then perfectly timed um i start hearing this this music now i had the tv on at the the time for, for mostly sort of for you know background noise so i i thought it was that mm. um it was but i couldn't hear the tv to be honest you couldn't no it was, it was no it was distracting to you know to say the least and um i know you'd sort of noticed me making a few sort of faces and you know kind of my eyes were wandering to sort of figure out where it was coming from yeah i paused or muted the telly and uh i could still hear it and i'm thinking where's that coming from and i i just got i was just getting to the point where i was saying to you is is that music coming from like your end, like if you've got the telly on your end or something, and yeah. you gave me a similar look and was like, Can you hear that? Yeah. And because uh, I could hear something faint on yeah. my end of things. Yeah. And that's where I was like, Yeah, no, I can I can hear music, but I have no idea where it's coming from. Obviously, we we don't record the sort of calls on a on a Thursday. No. So I took the headset off and I could hear that it was coming from um, my wife's Alexa, which is set up in the kitchen, which is the next room on from where I was at the time, or where I'm sitting now, actually. Uh, but it, and it was really loud. And I even said to you, I said, you haven't heard me say the words Alexa or give any comment no. or, or anything well, like that. And well, it, I was talking at the time that it started playing. You were Thinking back yeah. on it. It was you so, talking, actually, yeah. Um, 
and so yeah and so i was just sitting there um just and, and thinking what the hell is, is is going on and so i've still got the headset off at this point and it was only when listening listening intently to what was playing <laughs> that uh <laughs> that i realized that it was the uh the classic uh lost in the woods by uh was it uh, frozen two it's from yeah a now, song called lost in the, lost woods. In the woods <laughs> and we were talking about doing that very thing doing spirit boxes, you know, recording, you know, a live episode and EVPs and everything else. Now, you know, people listening might be thinking, well, song from Frozen isn't going to be particularly scary, is it? But the fact that the Alexa came on unprompted out of the millions of songs in its catalogue, that was the one it picked. At the very time, you were talking about being lost in the woods and me running scared because <laughs> yeah. because I'd heard something. Um and so yeah i'm then crapping myself because i was in the house on, on my own aside from you know the two kids who were both asleep it was pitch black for the most part and so i'm like right i've now got to walk out there and turn this bloody thing off <laughs> so um <laughs> yeah so it was uh Ooh, yeah so i then it was like huh? it was um so i was like, looking out of the peephole well i, I deliberately didn't because i just thought you know what <laughs> knowing my luck that's you know that's the next uh you know the next bloody thing so i um yeah, there'll be two black-eyed little shits out there waiting for you yeah well exactly <laughs> but so I'd, i i remember taking the headset off and holding it down the hallway and being like can you hear that like can you know can you hear the hear the song or whatever um you know to which you you know to which you could just to confirm that yeah it wasn't i could just, just hear making it up i could hear something but yeah. i couldn't i couldn't yeah. distinguish what it was yeah, well, anyone else to be honest, it? mate, your reaction was good enough for me, mate. That was <laughs> it was brilliant. I've never seen you go white before. <laughs> well, mate, that's that's the, that's the first time anything like that has happened. Um, you know, and everything lined up. Our, you know, our conversation, what we were talking about. Yeah. And the moment you started talking about that in particular, that song came on unprompted from an Alexa in another room. And yeah, out of all the songs it could have played at that time, if it was just a random uh, like glitch or something, why it would it have picked some random song? Well, why would it have picked that one uh, I don't... in particular? That's what, yeah, that, that, that's what got me. And so then I had to gingerly kind of shuffle down the hallway towards the kitchen, <laughs> try and scramble for the light to make sure there wasn't see, anyone I could in see there. your reflection. I could see your reflection in your conservatory door. So I could yeah. see you shuffling down the hallway to the kitchen as well. <laughs> okay. And it was so brilliant. I wasn't you rushing down little there. steps. <laughs> I wasn't rushing down there for anyone, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen too many horror films to know that the idiot oh. always runs in there first. <laughs> yeah. too, you know, too quick, gets their head lopped off or something. Oh, my. Yeah, but not only did I, did I have to say, like, you know, Alexa, stop. I turned that fucking thing off at the wall as well. <laughs> Plug that bitch. <laughs> yeah. Put it in the freezer. Exactly. Yeah. I wasn't. Uh, yeah. I wasn't um, uh, taking any chances with that one. That's for sure. Well, you know what I'm taking from that, then yeah. Go on. It's going to be you doing the blind spirit box, not me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I ain't getting lost in the woods. You're getting That's lost all, in yeah, the well, woods, sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I need. That's all. Yeah, I, need. I know, right? Um, yeah. No, exactly. So that was. Uh, that was, yeah, well, it was funny and terrifying um, at the same time. Um, yeah. But it's the first thing that's of that sort of nature that's really yes, happened to me. The, that I would, the first bit of strangeness has ever happened to you, isn't it? Yeah, that I would openly admit to being a, a strange occurrence or whatever. Because, you know, for the most part, I'd always try and look for the logical explanation as to why something well, happened. Yeah, or, you even... You even messaged me the next day. So I even you accused you of up, winding mate. me up. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> yeah. "What are you winding me up? Did you do something? How did you do like? this?" <laughs> yeah, because I was convinced it hadn't, you know, it hadn't uh, hadn't happened. Um, and, and, and I suppose the other thing as well to say is that it's never done that before. You know, it's never glitched or anything before. To me, to think well, oh, it happens before, it's probably picked up a word and you know, and picked the closest song or whatever. It's never done. You know, well, I mean, these like Alexas, that. they do have some weird things going on. There's plenty mm. of videos out there that that that, that show some mm. proper weird stuff. That, that have. like when uh, the, the best one that I've ever seen, it really made me chuckle because of everyone's reaction. For some reason, they were filming it, but they're all in the kitchen. They're all having a laugh, and everyone's laughing. And then every once the laughter dies down, a little bit over the way, is Alexa goes, 
<laughs> just like, <laughs> what? Oh, oh. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Where's is, where's that come from? Has it got sentience? Does it understand humour? What is it? You know, what but yeah, exactly. yeah, we've all seen Ultron. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was just yes, yeah, so that was um yeah, that was particularly me. particularly weird. But I, like I said, I'm glad that you were there because if if I if I was telling this so story, am I. <laughs> yeah, I know you were. If I was telling this story otherwise, I don't think I'd be convinced and I, know, I, don't, I don't know if anyone else would but the fact that you were there to corroborate my story knows that I'm not going mad <laughs> and that it did yeah. actually happen did so actually this isn't happen. this isn't a promo bit for the podcast or you know us starting to kind of make things up just to kind of you know add in no. some scary stories this is a genuine creepy as shit well, <laughs> well John Kill did say something along the lines of a long winded way of when you look at it it looks back at you it looks back at you and I think that is yeah, I think that's happening, you know, for us both. Because I know you in the mm-hmm. last episode had a, had you know, had a what well, a thing with the, the pheasant and the young, uh, the, the young boy at the bus stop. And, well, I haven't uh, seen so. any young lads with blue coats walking by, and believe me, I've been watching. So it's yeah. yeah. So with any luck, at least that part of it's done, and we can move on to some other weird shit that happens to well, us. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which kind of nicely segues um into this next bit now before we actually jump into the uh subject of the uh the podcast and following on from my <laughs> or our story from uh, during the week yep. um we're looking to hopefully introduce a new little segment um to, yeah. to the beginning of the uh the episodes um and we're looking to call this segment listener encounters which is mm. i know catchy um you know, there's a real think tank around thinking. We'll learn some, uh, we'll learn some uh, awards for that one, mate. Exactly Probably. right. Originality. <laughs> and all that, yeah. Um, it has come about because conveniently um, we've had exactly that. A listener has uh, written into us with, uh, with, with an encounter. Um, yeah, we with have. Sort of a creepy goings on that, uh, that they experienced and pretty recently as well. Um, now, I know that this came into you directly, Scott, didn't it? So did you want to? Yes. Do you want to take it away? And- sure thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this comes in from uh, a listener um, by the name of James. And me and James go back quite a way. Um, we haven't interacted much over the years, but, you know, we very much used to be part of the same sort of family friend group. So all the family do's and such when we were younger, um, we'd, we'd often be at those as well. So... He's uh, he's recently been messaging me saying he's been enjoying the podcast, which is great. You know, I love the fact that he's uh, that he's been reaching out to us and and uh, and expressing how much he's enjoying it. Um, but he had uh, he had a bit of a strange strange happening um, a little yeah. while ago. So I'll give you a bit of background on James. James is a he's a forklift uh, engineer and he's currently working in a cold storage warehouse. Um, okay. He's been, at the time he was working nights and uh, his night shift would often finish at around about 2 a.m. Mm. Now, from the point at which he finishes up and has to walk out of the warehouse, it's about a 15 to 20 minute walk to get out of the warehouse and into his car. That's right. So what? So the, the area in which this warehouse is, is situated is a very sparsely popular populated area there's mm. you know there's a part of the the car park that backs on to a lot of marshes there's a couple of other buildings dotted about but otherwise it's it's very secluded yeah okay so but there's a lot of ambient noise when mm. you walk out of the main lobby area and he sent a, sent me a video to demonstrate what it's like walking out there and there's a mm. lot of noise um outside yeah, and that's from the because he says there's an incinerator chimney about 100 yards away um, and it billows out smoke and constantly go in so there's always sound there's always noise there's a usual drone from the incinerator and mm. refrigeration units etc but this particular night that he came out as he exited the building and started to go across the car park to his car he had a strange feeling come over him and he realized that he couldn't hear the usual warehouse noises and he just like he had this strange feeling, like almost like um, like a blanket had been put over him mm. and was holding him tight. It's kind of how it's not his words, but it's kind of how he describes it to me. And 
he remembers looking at the trees and mm. seeing that the wind was blowing, mm. but he couldn't hear it. He couldn't hear the wind going through the trees. And stranger still, he couldn't even hear his foot, his footsteps either. Now, this happened for like about a, a minute or two, and he had this odd feeling that was still coming over him, and it, yeah. it continued for a little while longer. Mm. Then it seems like his ears popped, like um, like a sudden change in elevation. Yeah. You know, like when you just go down a hill or, yeah. you know, maybe even... Normally when you're um, in the car, it happens, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, or if you're on the underground, you know, the central line is mm. terrible for it because yeah. there's so much noise on that thing and the change, sudden change in, in elevation, it makes your ears pop. Yeah. Then as his ears popped, all the sound came back to him and he felt normal again. And he was just like, oh, that was really weird. That was just, I don't know what to make of that. And uh, after he got back into his car, you know, about the, you know, the silence of that metal bubble that is your car, he realised yeah. that he's, he had a low tone ringing in his ears. Right. Um, but what he noted was that the whole time, the whole thing seemed so strange and that it felt like he was in a vacuum. Now, he didn't really make any sort of, he just kind of brushed it off really and dismissed it. Um, but then he listened to our episode in which we mentioned the Oz effect. Yeah, you mentioned it last last time. Yeah, I mentioned it mentioned it very very briefly, um, and uh, he that's when he reached out to me and said, "Look, mate, well, I just listened to this about what you said about being in a vacuum, hmm. and that pretty much explains what I experienced." So I mean, he said it lasted merely seconds, like it wasn't happening for minutes or anything like that. It was like he walked into this area, the mm. sound just like completely spot, disappeared. Almost. Yeah, like like it's yeah. like a bubble, mm. like a bubble, like like what well, the Oz effects, the Oz effect yeah. um, is described as being walking into an invisible bubble yeah. that sound can't penetrate. But it happened to um, John Kill, didn't it? If you remember in the um, Mothman yeah. episode that we did, he he recalls um, going on a, a sort of a scout to a location where a lot of locals had mm. reported to have seen it. And you remember driving up and down a road when you hit a particular part of the road, you had that exact, almost that exact thing, wasn't it? Well, the thing is that the Oz effect seems to precede high strangeness. So whether that's spotting yeah. a UFO or having contact with something, or yeah. usually, usually there's like missing time. That's right. Or anything yeah. like that. So I did ask him and he wasn't really sure if there was any missing time, but that could be, <sighs> missing time could be, anywhere as much as milliseconds. several hours or seconds. Yeah. You know, you just, it's, and unless you're very much aware of it, then you You'll never know. maybe notice it maybe. Yeah, exactly. Um, You'll never know. But I mean, he, he even sent me a message afterwards as well, just saying like, you know, just trying to, I try and think of it logically and, you know, try and see it, try and explain it away. You know, know so you tried to explain that about being tired. <laughs> yeah, ain't that right? <laughs> Maybe you did say something that Alexa picked up on it. Maybe, hopefully, hopefully it did. Yeah, hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he even goes as far as to say maybe it was a lapse in brain function, which I think is a bit harsh. Of himself, I think that's really. a bit harsh. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know if the guy. I don't understand. Even I was like, no, it's not going to. It's not going to be that, is it? Like, <laughs> yeah. No, man. He's. Unless it happens all the time. Brain function. Exactly. He said it's literally the first time it's yeah. ever happened. And he's done those exactly. night shifts for uh, forever, he was mm. saying. So it was it was very, very odd. Um, but yeah, like I said, he he's never experienced anything like that before. So it was quite interesting. And I'm really thankful for him for reaching out and oh, saying absolutely. that no, maybe definitely. we've opened him up to a bit more information that's, that's out there. Hopefully so. Um, I mean, that's the sort of... Um you know, the interactions that we want with, you know, with, with kind of listeners. And it's, it's actually quite mm. cool to think that we've actually sort of helped him in a way, you know, yeah. by, by well, talking about that and it resonating with him and the experience that he's had. As you say, it's yeah. opened him up to information that you might not have known about. I know you mentioned to you about, mm. you know, getting a bit of stick from, you know, the lads at work and stuff. Yeah, so the fact that he felt comfortable coming to you, you know, sort of slash us, mm. to, you know, with that is, um, no, he's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is that's really cool of him as well. I mean, really, me and James haven't really spoken in a in a very long time. I think the last time I saw him was at my uncle's sixtieth over mm -hmm. in South Ockenden. So that was oh, wow. quite that was a, a while ago. ago quite, yeah, quite a few years ago. Mm. So 
it was um, yeah, very much appreciate that, James. So yeah, shout out to you, mate. bud. Yeah, cheers, man. Um, but it certainly does sound like he's experienced uh, the Oz effect there because yeah, he's detailed other things in his in his story to me that I didn't mention about no, you it. Wouldn't have so known unless. They were yeah, unless he has done a bit of research and, and such, but it doesn't certainly doesn't sound that from the sound bites that he's that he sent me. So, but yeah, so obviously no, we're good. hoping we're 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 not um, expecting a new story from our listeners every single week. But not every episode, if you do, no. if you do have one, then uh, you can always send one to us, even if you want to send it anonymously. You know, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's cryptid ramblers podcast at hotmail.com. So yeah, yeah. send us. Uh, anything any even if it's not you know your own stories if you've got family members or you know friends or something who've had a you know an experience they don't mind you sharing it then um yeah we'd, we'd yeah. love to read them and share them like we said we can always keep it anonymous as well so you know yeah, it's uh, i think it's certainly very entertaining and uh, mm. i mean no, i've, I've asked enjoyed listening james as well to keep me up to date as well if anything else happens so yeah exactly that'd be good if it's different different times and you know different parts of the the unit that he works in that kind of thing yeah it'd be good to sort of know whether it's a one and done type thing or you know whether it's a a regular thing i mean i I suppose i I hope it's not a regular thing for him because it could lead to the stuff down the line but well ain't that right yeah but i I certainly hope that it then you know that nothing terrible falls upon you no um, and such but yeah, thanks for certainly thanks yeah. for getting into contact yeah. and uh, telling us about it, James. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you, mate. Um, right, so that that leads us into um, into this episode and, and what we're yeah. gonna, and what we're going to cover. Um, and if if you remember uh, from the last episode, we are going to be covering the mysterious uh, individuals who are none other than the women in black. Um, they are known as the creepy companions of the elusive men in black um, and have a very similar MO. Um, and this we will, of course, cover um, in the uh, in the episode. Um, encounters with the women in black, or WIBs, uh, follow a very odd and unnerving pattern, uh, much like the, the men in black. Um, but they are actually more sinister and, believe it or not, more threatening um certainly to you know your life and well-being than what the the men in black were um so i can't remember the name of the song but the female of the species uh is certainly that's more exactly than the male <laughs> that's by space that's it that's the yeah one. yeah i couldn't think of the name <laughs> of it <laughs> um now we're going to be covering a, obviously a whole host of things i suppose it's worth mentioning that you know much like our previous episodes there isn't really one main encounter or one main story um that we are going to be you know kind of retelling or or sort of reading from um this one has got a host of a host of plenty really yes um that are all detailed in uh, the book which is aptly named women in black um mm-hmm. by nick redfern now you can buy the paperback but i, I know we both listen to the uh, audio book which is mm-hmm. uh, a little over six hours. Um, and and quite... Nick Redfern's very much an accomplished author as well. He's, he's oh, very much written so. many yeah. books, especially, I think he's written three books on The Men in Black just as a, a subject Alone, itself. Yeah, exactly. And he came, he started finding a lot of uh, connections with various different stories that, yeah. you know, that um, encompass The Men in Black behaviours and yeah. such. And then... But there was a slight twist to it in that it was women in black. But yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. Which I suppose a, as a disclaimer as well for the, the listeners, prior to uh, this episode, I hadn't or the research for this episode at least, I didn't really have much in the way of any knowledge of the women in black and that they were mm. part of this, you know, part of this, you know, cryptozoology, this, you know, this mythology. So um, yeah. as soon as I heard it sort of name dropped it was when actually um doing the black eye children um that it actually sort of came about certainly you know for me and even looking through some of the encounters which we did cover uh or certainly elements of in the men in black episode i was astonished that you know mention well, of these women well, never, the thing never is, popped up 
Well, we didn't even make the connection in the, no. in, in some of the stories that we, no. that we over the past couple of episodes, really. But yeah, I, I only knew about the Women in Black again through Nick Redfern's uh, articles and such because he yeah. writes profusely for Mysterious <laughs> Universe, uh, yeah. which is a fantastic podcast as well. Get yeah, like, constantly going on about various different high strangeness. Um, I am actually a plus subscriber for them. And their yeah, content is yeah. is phenomenal. It's brilliant. I love that it. It is good. I have listened um, to a handful myself, mostly for research purposes for our own, uh, admittedly. Mm. Um, I know we've given them shout outs before just to thank them for the sort of they are really They are from. great. And Nick Redfern, like I say, he often writes for them on, on their does. articles page and, and such. And that, that was really the only reason why I think that I heard about the women in black was because of his articles. Yeah, um, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. And then, the uh, then uh, came across his thing. book as well, which was, you yeah. know, and I, I, I was kind of sitting on it for quite a while, never really thought, oh yeah, I'll look into that, look into that. And it's mm. once you went, oh my god, women in black, mate. Yeah. I was like, yeah, okay, it oh, warrants it that. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it warrants that now. Yeah, so exactly. I think we we got to the right point in our sort of timeline of cryptids to uh mm. sort of tackle this one um especially off the back of the high creepiness of the uh, black eye children which was our um our last episode and, and that kind yeah. of segued quite nicely into you know into this one um because one of the you know obviously one of the theories is that the black eye children were a, a you know an entity of of sorts um there's a couple that, of theories that, that, were kind that of pull out of they, they, there's a couple of theories that pull out of this research as well as to what the black-eyed yeah, children exactly. are. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which so, we, uh, yeah, we'll no doubt cover later on in the uh, the episode. Um, we're expanding, ladies and gentlemen. We are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but look, the, the sort of things we're going to cover is going to be a, a host of different encounters and you know, sort of theories, um, mostly from Nick Redfern's uh, book. Um, but we we're going to start with you know appearances um unintentionally um it's worth mm. noting as an extra uh in the in charlie chaplin's 1928 film the circus yes. uh and we you know we go right through to the phantom social workers that swept the uk in the 80s um and unsurprisingly we do wind up back in point pleasant west virginia oh mountain uh, mama just for the <laughs> just because <laughs> why not just because why not um so as, as we also mentioned at the end of the last episode we have tried to basically not regurgitate the same information or, or stories that we would have previously gone over in our men in black episode uh, and luckily for the most part they are entirely different so mm. aside from referencing a few individuals uh and like i just did there a few places like point pleasant that should really be the only the only things that hopefully this is all new and fresh for you guys as it was for for us or well, certainly uh certainly myself um so look without uh without further ado um let's get into it let's go man. let's go let's go um so yes as i mentioned at the at the top there um the first reported uh, actual sighting and uh, certainly on film um yeah. of, a, of a woman in black uh, was in yeah the 1928 film um, The Circus, uh, starring Charlie Chaplin. Now, interestingly, it wasn't originally when the film was released that it was necessarily pointed out. It was actually, I think, in 2010 when they re-released the DVD yeah. um, with some you know extras, deleted scenes, and you know behind the scenes type stuff that this particular clip. Um, was found and it, it basically shows um, an elderly woman um, in a black woolen hat, a long black um, overcoat uh, and black t- uh, blacked out uh, sunglasses um, walking down the street in the sort of the back of the shot holding to her ear what looks to be like a mobile phone. Mm. Now, of course, we're talking 1928, so such devices wouldn't have been uh, wouldn't well, have been around then. Um, well, it also, turns out, it turns out. Oh, sorry, mate. It, it turns out it was um, it was being made in 1926, and uh, 
through various oh, they, personal yeah. issues, Charlie Chaplin didn't actually release it until 28. Oh, um, right. Okay, so he, went through, he went through a, a divorce as well, oh, right, um, and many other bits and pieces. There was a fire at his studio. There were scratches on the negatives. There was basically, there was someone was trying to stop this film from coming out. Yeah. Mm, Which, coincidental? No, yeah, well, I think not. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so that, <laughs> yeah. No, that's interesting. I did actually... Yeah, I generally didn't didn't know that. Um, no, so that I mean that certainly adds credence to you know the lady that was spotted in the in the in the back of the shot. And again, you know she wasn't making herself known. She wasn't deliberately in in shot. You know she was actually walking. You know sort it of looked- across the the screen, if you like. You know uh, from right to left, I believe. Um, yeah. You know just kind of minding her own business, doing her own thing. And you know you you see through the we'll share it on the socials. I, I did find a, a clip of it on. YouTube yep. and she, she basically looks away from the, the sort of the camera gradually until she's looking down at the floor and you see her holding something to her ear as she's walking you know through the uh That's right. the so she's, yeah she's going from right to left um with her left hand closest to the camera up to her That's face right. yep. and as she's walking you can see her mouth moving so yep. she's talking into, into something, something yeah. and then she stops kind of turns a little bit to the left laughs she must spot the camera at this point and then she ducks her head and then down. she does it's it. like yeah, that's right. oh, but like she's walked into oh bloody oh there's a camera there yeah you know and then, she's then the scene oblivious. sort of cuts and fades into something else yeah exactly so she's completely oblivious to kind of what was going on and now, now a few of the i mean including the director of the film uh a few sort of Charlie himself you exactly yeah a few eyewitnesses um at the time the strangest thing to them was the fact that she had on the big overcoat and the woolen hat on because the the time of year that it was when they made the film and the the the, the weather that they would have had wouldn't have given a reason to wrap up in in that way well, so no, again it it's... just feeds into their mo of, of being oddly dressed for either the time period or the, the well absolutely situation. because i did look into it a little bit further and like i said it was it was Filming began on the 11th of January, but it, it of 1926. But it seems like majority of the filming was actually done in the summer months in LA. So if she's dressing with this massive overcoat and a woolen hat, and what well, oh, did you notice? Her shoes. That like her shoes were like yeah. oversized. So you know, like they're like, you know, like some of the on a... you know like some of the lads that wear their uh, the loafers now with the great big points on the front of them. Yeah, they're winkle pickers. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the winkle yeah. pickers. She looked like she was wearing yeah. winkle pickers. Yeah, like witchy, like witchy poo shoes, but they were too big for <laughs> yeah. that sort of thing. Then she'd ironed them out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't yeah. cold up at the end. She'd ironed them out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It just looked really weird. Looked she looked odd. Well out of place. Mm. She's. I mean, I've known about that footage for quite a while. Not in this sense, in that it's mm. in a woman in black sort of sense. Right. Although she is a woman in black, yeah. but from a time traveler sort of view because I've, mm. I've watched i've seen plenty of those videos on youtube time travelers caught on tape and yeah. stuff like that and exactly so i have known about that particular footage and i never really looked at it in the same light that nick redfern has you know and no. it's i liked that i liked what he was saying about it but yeah that yeah again just it just all looks a bit and... odd it does, yeah, and you, you could be forgiven for thinking, well, it's a film called The Circus, so is she an extra? Is she a you know cast member in costume or in an outfit or whatever? She but, didn't seem to have a beard, so... No, exactly. So she's, she was not, she's not part of The Circus. No, exactly. So, no, and that's it. And people have sort of said, you know, we don't know who she was. She wasn't supposed to be in the shot. And you can tell by how awkward she looks when she realises you yeah. know, how, yeah, how awkward it all... Uh, you know, it all really is. So yeah, so that's the uh, Charlie Chaplin uh, sort of incident. I thought that encounter would be quite good to mm. start off with, just because it's sort of such a, a sort of a famous uh, person involved. Um, although I don't think he was directly linked to the encounter, but you know, it was also a film of yeah. his, and he would have been on set and stuff. Um, now, as he's mentioned as well in the uh, intro, uh, we do wind up back in good old Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Mm, West Virginia. Um, yeah. Our favourite part of the world, it would seem. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we are back on uh, hot on the heels on uh, John Kill uh, in his hunt for the 
famed Mothman, which we also mm. cover in uh, in an earlier episode. Um, now, this uh, is around the early 1960s, and uh, it's, uh, it includes a group of uh, women in black, WIBs, um, essentially posing as censor takers or uh, census takers census takers yeah um in or seen around that area and you know much like the men in black they would just randomly turn up at, at people's houses they would use this mm -hmm. as their way of um you know being accepted into the the home um it would start out relatively normal um in terms of the, the questions so you know so what you'd expect to find on a on a census so it'd be things how like how many people you know, in the home yeah and average income in the household yeah how many people lived in the home how many rooms the home had that that kind of thing how many um, vehicles all that sort of stuff yeah all, yeah all that sort of gubbins yeah um and then as expected with with these types um <laughs> they the, the the questioning then took or would take a sudden uh, sort of odd turn as uh, as a lot of people uh, reported they would then start asking the inhabitants of the property whether they'd had any strange dreams of late, um, mm. any telephone interference when making a, a phone call, um, and what their beliefs were regarding UFOs. Yeah, um, which is a very, very odd set of questions for census takers to start asking, very, isn't it? Well, very odd and strangely uh, specific. <laughs> yeah, um, it was, it was no, also noted that a lot of them turned up late at night as well which yeah, again, same if you're census takers black. yeah you wouldn't be turning up at night you know you'd be you know no. you, you're nine to five sort of thing like you're not you're not yeah. knocking on someone's door at half past four you know <laughs> you're getting ready to go home well, no, exactly and uh, their their appearance was you know obviously odd as well as we've kind of briefly um discussed and they followed a similar um kind of appearance pattern as the uh, the men in black uh, whereby mm. they'd wear either uh, black uh, long black wigs uh, or um, not um, sort of pork pie hats but you know woolen sort of black woolen uh, hats in you know mm. in the same way that the men would wear like a fedora um, long it's black so overcoats black shoes you know the, the, the usual get up that you would you know that you'd expect mm. which also wasn't fit in with you know the the local you know the local Point government Pleasant, West Virginia. Point Pleasant at that time, which is why you yeah. know they thought John Kill was uh, was highly suspicious when he was uh, first on the scene because of his attire coming from uh, was New York, I think it was, or yeah, something yeah, like coming that. from New York. He had a he had a big old beard going on. He yeah, had, he wore black sh black uh, suits, the black yeah. uh, hat. He so was he, over six foot tall as well. Well, exactly. So um, he unintentionally fit the mo as well, and so you, you could see that that type of you know whether they thought that because it was women it would be less um you know it'd be less threatening or or invasive I, you know i don't know but yeah as you say turning up late at night to carry out a census um and not only that but then to start asking very odd and specific questions did mm. obviously arouse yeah. suspicion quite quickly within the within the town but also they seem to be quite forceful not like just like forcefully like prat practically forcing their way in almost like yeah. oh you know it, so this, that's kind of a contrast to um other men in black uh, encounters that we covered in a previous episode but it does also because we're also kind of linking the women in black men in black and the black eyed children yes and right. because the black eyed children does all do also come up in in our research and it does which yeah. will go on a little bit more about later on but it's in that's in direct contrast because it seems like the women in black are the only ones that are really kind of a bit more forceful and yeah, maybe not definitely. necessarily playing by the rules if there's some sort of no. set rules that the men in black and the black eyed children are adhering to then the women in black really ain't they're on a different yeah they're reading from a different rule book and that, that's kind of mm. what i alluded to in in the intro in the sense that they are more kind of threatening um you know to your kind of well-being you know if mm. if you don't comply with what they want to achieve uh whether that be an abduction or or getting information from you then they they turn you know aggressive very quickly yeah. um so they seem a little bit more kind of switched on or a little bit more determined to get to their end game 
whereas you know the men in black from what we covered were a little bit more out of touch um a little bit more kind of um they, they get you know, they, they'd faff a lot get things wrong make mistakes um whereas much the, like humans eh? Hey, isn't it much much honest. like human men to be honest yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the women are a lot more assertive They've got a better idea on what they need to achieve and pretty much they'll achieve it by any means necessary um and that's certainly what we've uh yeah sort of come to um come to realize now it's worth just mentioning uh, as well that uh and I, we do briefly mention it in the many black episode as well but uh John Kill himself reportedly uh, had a secretary um, who mm. it transpired was actually a woman in black posing as uh, his secretary because they know, know that he's a prominent figure in the world of, you know, cryptids and UFOs and strange happenings. Um, obviously he was and, there at that time. And he was there at that time, which they've been aware of. Um, mm. And yeah, so she posed as his secretary, uh, to try and add a bit of weight to kind of their mission in terms of questioning, you know, being openly invited into people's homes, uh, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so again, you know, it ties us back to not only West Virginia, but, uh, it, you know, the Mothman and kind of those goings on as well, um, which is, uh, yeah, which is always good. Um, yeah. Now, just... But that the one thing that I did find as well with regards to the, this sort of behaviour about them posing as as census takers, yeah, I found again that's a lot more clever mm. than a government agent or a military officer or something yeah. something something along the lines of like social sort yeah. of so I kind of guess what we call sociology. Isn't it? So it serves more for someone's... purpose. It gives a reason for them to be there, regardless of the time of day. It gives them a specific purpose, not just you know randomly knocking on doors, asking random mm. questions. They start off with you know we're here from you know the council, local government, however it's set up. You know we're here to take the census. We'll hit you with the standard questions, and then we'll segue into our own um, kind of intention and and ask some weird old questions. Which follows on to. So that exact same mo but maybe a bit more sinister one yes where <laughs> they pose as social workers they do um, yes which is incredibly disturbing because very much they so. yeah. in they were doing that in the 1970s over over the other side of the pond but they well, were exactly. doing that here in the uk in the 80s and the 90s yeah so about 20 yeah 20 years uh, later um all around the uk um, Scotland and Ireland uh, specifically, uh, it was something that became known as the Phantom Social Workers or PSWs um, in sort of local press, you know, certainly over here. Um, mm. And yeah, it, it, they, it wasn't a census as such, obviously they were posing as social workers and what they would do is they would go to homes where they knew young children were, uh, where, you know, were, you know, were living and they would claim that they had received reports that uh, children were being abused in these yeah. family homes. Now, whether that was, you know, sexual, physical, you know, I, I don't. They didn't really I go into the, too much kind of detail, but you can. Yeah, I think Nick. I think Nick just idea. puts down uh, physical abuse. Physical abuse. So yeah, that, that can mean that, whatever. It? And they're obviously going on that tact because that's the more serious. It gives them. A reason to be there you know it gives them mm. credibility to why they're maybe being aggressive and you know trying to remove the children you know from their you know from their homes um obviously the intention from certainly what the parents themselves felt and also uh nick, nick redfern uh is that they they were there to essentially abduct the children um mm. you know for their own you know, for their own for whatever uses. reason. I mean, now, whether that was to actually then use them in, you know, in their, um, you know, in, in, in their processes, because obviously, you know, we've mentioned that black eyed children working closely with the men in black. Is this how they got the black eyed children? Mm. You know, was it kids that were abducted well, at that age, which is why the age range was so vast with the black eyed children from, you know, the age of six to eight i think right up to about 16 years of age now was that because yeah. they would just knock on you know from door to door uh, and would just abduct the, the first child that they saw 
you know in that in that home and well that... the thing is i'm sure there's plenty of uh, plenty of parents or even single mothers that are incredibly vulnerable that exactly wouldn't yeah. necessarily fight back with it or, or just or no. couldn't fight back with it so no exactly out of out of the nine cases that might have called the police and you know the the old women in black scarpa mm. there may have been one or two that they managed to get the child um and i, I think exactly I, I think i mentioned it before about the with the black eyed children that there were stories of changelings um, in the mm. Dina Shi, where they were either taken right. yeah. or, or given, and kind of like the uh, the Night King in Game of Thrones, where they then yeah. change them, change into them into the their Black own Children. sort of yeah. thing, almost like whether it's a, a hybrid sort of thing or yeah. or an actual different entity. Well, that's why um, it would explain why they they always stay at that age, you know, yeah, because of because of that because they were you know, turn into whatever entity they've become, you know, at that age for a specific, you know, purpose. So uh, um, like like Kirsten Dunst in the interview with the vampire. Well, yeah, that pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Which again, t- you know, sort of ties vampires, um, you know, back into it, which I know is a theory we discussed briefly at the end of the yeah. last episode. So it's all... But even, all even for this lot, up. even for this mob, the women in black, that's even the theory that they're vampires well, as so well. So they are, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I thought it was in, it was interesting and kind of important, I think, to, to mention that um, because of the... Yeah, because of the, the you know, the connections, it, you know, it also mm. brings it, you know, back over to, you know, sort of the UK, which was something that was widely reported and and publicized in the uk yeah. at the time it was a real hot thing of you know i remember i remember my mum and dad talking about it in mm. the 90s and like then you know mum being absolutely mortified that something like that would happen and yeah. i think yeah, that I mean, might even have sparked the uh you know don't talk to strangers talk because it was such a you know, mm. widely publicised thing. I think it was something along those. I, I seem to remember it. Whether it's, I don't know, whether I'm making it up or not, I don't know. But it, it seems to be a memory. Um, you know, I don't have many from when I was younger. <laughs> um, but it, it, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, there was some resemblance. It was all the alcohol, know, when I, mate, wasn't it? Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It was. Yeah, there was something anyway when reading through the actual reports at the, you know, for mm. this research that sort of clawed something back. Anyway, whether, you know, whether it's a memory or not, I don't know, but. Yeah, it's certainly, um, you know, sort of found itself familiar. Um, now, they're just a number of the, the kind of the brief encounters that uh, Nick goes over in his uh, in his book. Um, I think we're now going to dive into um, those that we found are, the, you know, they were probably the most compelling, um, you know, the most interesting, um, and also those that kind of, you know, in all honesty, tie in some of our previous episodes in terms of the beliefs the theories you know the the origins of of what yeah you know women in black um you know could be um and it also you know with the next one that we'll go into it also does keep us in in the 80s but we're, we're back over the pond in uh, in new york uh, this time oh, no. in 1987 uh with a book editor by the name of bruce lee um mm-hmm. Not the Bruce Lee you're thinking of. Um, no. Nope. Which was my <laughs> initial thought when I saw the name pop up. <laughs> I was like, hang on. No way, that's, Charlie Chaplin, that's not Bruce when that Lee. happened. <laughs> yeah. That's not <laughs> yeah. how it went down, surely. We've got yeah. a star-studied episode. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, he, yeah, he, so he's a, um, he's a book editor, as I say. He worked for a publisher by the name of Marrow, I think it was, or Marrow. Um, right, Marrow. And, yeah. I think, I, think the, I think the Americans would pronounce it as Marrow. Marrow, yeah. Yeah. So. that's why I th- I th- that's why i went with that first i think um they yeah so he has an encounter with uh with one of each actually two agents uh, a man and woman uh, in black uh, in a new york bookstore um now he he notes that the the, the female was wearing a again a, a black woolen hat sunglasses and a uh, long scarf um and yeah, her, her partner, obviously the male, um, was dressed very much how we've already gone over in our previous episodes, mm-hmm. a black suit, sunglasses, uh, black fedora. Um, now, there's, there's a couple of things that, that kind of intrigued him about this this couple, is that when they walked in, they made a beeline for 
a, a particular book um, which is called Communion by Whitney Schreiber. Now, Whitley. say that again. Whitley, Whitley Schreiber. Oh, so I thought it was Whitney. You no, Whit Whitley. <laughs> Whitley. Whitley, yeah. Yeah, a gentleman sound, called Whitley Streber. That doesn't even sound right. Okay, all right. Well, I'll stay corrected. <laughs> I could have sworn they said Whitney, but uh, yeah, but, but the, yeah, so the, the, that's the, the book which actually we're both going to kind of read separately because we yeah. think there's a read, there's a separate reason why that, that name is sorry, that book has been name dropped mm. in this particular um, encounter. Well. But the, the, the two things that kind of caught Bruce's eye with this is that. For, they didn't they look like out of towners so but but they knew exactly where to go for this book now it only mm. just come out recently so it wouldn't have been kind of hot off the uh, press um but they made a beeline for it they knew exactly where it was and when they both picked it up they were basically speed reading it so i imagine that they were just kind of like flicking through the pages super fast mm. you know kind of picking up you know what was on these pages you know and i think the other thing that threw him off was the female of the two um started laugh laughing maniacally uh, and in quite a sort That's of right, yeah. tone um and it, it freaked him out and it obviously caught his attention now it freaked everyone else out in the bookshop exactly yeah he actually he actually approached them um as well because the other thing was that the the book in particular was published by the company that he works for yeah. So he was interested to actually get some feedback on the book because, like I say, it only just come out. So he was looking for some kind of first-hand uh, kind of feedback or you know a mm. review of sorts. And he he quizzes them because he's like, "Well, it's not really a funny, a funny book. So why was she laughing?" And I think he sort of asks her a question along that sort of line, um, mm. to which the, right. the couple basically look at each other um, in a sort of a confused manner. Um, and they both sort of turn to kind of stare at him, and Bruce notices, I think you mentioned this before we recorded, uh, that Bruce notices her eyes um, yeah. from, from kind he, of behind the glasses. Is that right? He describes them as huge, mad dog eyes. Like, yeah, this, this she ain't right yet, sort of thing. Well, I mean, yeah. she's laughing maniacally in a bookstore, and we all know yeah. you treat bookstores like a library. Yeah, so exactly, you, yeah. <laughs> you do not raise your voice in a bookstore <laughs> so, well it's a ufo book as well so i can't imagine yeah. it's full of laughs and so that's your gags. first faux pas love you know? yeah yeah but also it was worth Definitely. noticing as well that he he describes as he's walking toward them in order to engage in conversation he starts getting yeah. this really odd feeling like yeah uh, like almost like kind of like revulsion really that's kind of how i picked yeah, it up it's that kind in the of same unease. sort of sense as the previous yeah episodes we've done where yeah. they've approached a being of some sort and it's they've just got this really uneasy feeling and then as he's yeah. kind of engaged tried to engage in conversation with them and they've just met him with silence one mm -hmm. they either don't even speak english no there was that yeah and they i mean it's it's just weird i mean what do you what do you extrapolate from that do, is there some i know is there some sort of warning is there some sort of it's definitely weird. It's high strangeness, that's for sure. It's but... definitely weird. It's certainly high strangeness. Um, yeah. And interestingly, the, the encounter for the for the most part kind of stops there because Lee actually um, gets the fuck out bolts, of there. He bolts. Yeah. He's like fuck <laughs> this, and he he basically runs out of the out of the bookstore. Um, and he, he doesn't make it too far out when he kind of stops to kind of gather his thoughts to kind of try and process what had kind of just happened um but yeah, he got uh, that over censored that, that that overwhelming panic he did, he did he, yeah it's like that anxiety and that panic uh, and he just he which had is, to leave the the bookstore which, which is does. something we've also spoken about with it the is. men in black episode it is again yes it's all these synchronicities that are kind of tying in which is again one of the reasons why i wanted to mention this one mm. uh, in particular now if i remember rightly i think he, he he has this kind of almost panic attack of sorts he bolts out of the store he doesn't make it particularly far. He stops to kind of, I don't know, catch his breath, gather his thoughts or whatever. Um, and I think he actually says about kind of regrouping and wanting to sort of wanting to go back in there. Um, yeah. And when he does, they've disappeared. Now, with this particular library, there's only one way in and one way out. 
and they would have had to have passed him mm. to to, to, to you know to leave whether it you know whether it be to cross the road or, or walk whatever and he didn't see them leave the the building yet they disappeared from from the store um and so that's which the, again is very typical of these women in black and yeah. men in black encounters they just seem to appear out of nowhere and then just disappear disappear just as quickly yeah yeah no absolutely um so yes yeah, so again that's just uh, again quite an odd and again, like with these encounters, hopefully it's sort of coming across, but they, they seem to, they're, they're certainly kind of more, you know, on the, the sinister side on, you know, the creep factor is oh, definitely. You know, right on level, you know, up to 11, you know, on the Well, on we stuff. did, there's another one that's, that is mentioned as well, that mm. unfortunately it does end in a fatality. So it, I it guess, does, put a trigger it? warning like... in here because it's, it's not yeah. that long ago. It only happened in, no. in 2001. Yes, yeah, right. and uh, and that was uh, Colin Perks, and that was over was. here in the UK. Yes, it was. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, yes, yeah, so he was. Um, Colin Perks was. He basically became quite obsessed with the the legend of King Arthur, didn't he? That's right. And and yeah. searching for the the real person that may have inspired the the stories and such. And there's yeah. there's a, a rich amount of research out there and. As to where the stories of King Arthur and his Round Table and his his knights all came from, um, yeah, exactly, and the, kind of the truth rich... behind the folklore and stuff. It's it's rich in kind of stories in folklore. Oh, it's, a, and, it's a great story in the theories as to whether he was actually real and and if so, was he actually you know a sort of a, a king of sorts or was was it just a a kind of fabricated story from someone who might have been just a prominent. Um, a prominent figure but i think in on, on this particular occasion i think colin was wasn't he um he was trying to find the final resting place of that's uh, right King Arthur, which which took him to um which took him to glastonbury because i think that's where he thought he thought it was um mm. in, that's where a lot of a lot of the the king arthur researchers believe that camelot was in camelot was either in glastonbury or it was in a small small well, town glastonbury in Wales. itself Glastonbury itself is um, is a is kind of like a centre point for a lot of high strangeness. There's a lot of um, ley lines, um, That's right, energy yeah. grids, and stuff like that. I would say energy grids, like earth energy grids. Yeah, there's a lot of spiritual energy that happens in Glastonbury. Um, yeah, I'm sure right. that all goes out of the fucking window when the festival turns up, mind you. But yeah, I bet. Yeah, it, well, the, the high know, strange turns up. It just increases. <laughs> <laughs> it just increases, just increases through all enhancements. The, all the pillars, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he was obviously, yeah, he was, he was in and around Glastonbury, searching for the final resting place of the, uh, yeah, infamous King Arthur, um, and he he receives a visit mm. from a woman in black. Um, now she kind of didn't mess about. She wasn't pulling any punches. She just kind of jumps straight in and warns him against looking into um the paranormal yeah which i thought was strange because obviously his research was 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 king arthur um but her warning was against looking into the paranormal into the paranormal and there's yeah. something to obviously look into there which i'm sure we'll do in a well um, i think from what i because i did do a little bit more research on him itself and it seems like he did end up going down um i suppose what you would call an esoterical sort of route with it mm. so there's a lot of um in the story of the king arthur there's a lot of um symbolism but when i say esoterical it, a, lot of, a lot of people might initially think of things like um the freemasons and, and secret societies and stuff like that but yeah. just esoteric basically means hidden mm. so he was looking at various different methods as to how to go about finding the final rest of, resting yeah. place of King Arthur. So in a way, he was kind of touching upon the paranormal and mm. supernatural um, yeah, exactly, in yeah. his pursuits of finding this, this well, holy grail, I guess, really. So, well, yeah, um, his, his holy grail, I guess, in, in hunting down... Um, in, in, in King Arthur. Um, now this was a, again, it was, it was a knock on, on the door. Um, 
you know, she's standing there. Um, I think it's chucking with rain outside. Mm. Uh, she's bone dry without an umbrella, yes. which was something that he noticed that was quite odd. Um, and she just warns him against milk death. white skin as well. Milk white yes. skin, like yeah, yeah, like moonlight. Again, yeah, followed the sort of the the appearance of of pretty much any other men in black or, or woman in black uh, sort of encounter. Um, yeah, like, like I say, she warns him against the the paranormal um, and that he shouldn't look into it anymore and he should end all investigations. Uh, and all she says to him is that he uh, she's from a government agency, so there's no census check in. There's no no, no um, social worker intention. This is, you know, I'm from the government and I'm telling you that you need to do this. Under, yeah, you know, in no uncertain terms, do you continue? And she's very, very uh, forward, you know. Well, she's, that's it. exactly it. She says that she's from a secret branch of the UK government that's and right. they're intent on shutting down research into all realms of, of paranormal. That's right. Um, which, again, that's... that's um, it's a very specific way of saying it. All realms. Of all realms. Param you know, paranormal. A particular word usage there. That yeah, um, because there seems to be a, a trend that's been happening in the past maybe 10, possibly 15 years where the idea that the paranormal mm. is a different realm to what we experience here, almost like an a interdimensional sort of thing. So where yes, we exactly, exist yeah. in this particular realm, the physical realm or the material mm. realm, that there are spiritual, there are demonic, mm. there are all these various different realms. So yeah, that's right. In two thousand, in two thousand and one, mm. if that's the language that she was using, then that yeah. kind of I don't know. I, to be honest, it's a bit before my time of really getting into this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, would have been you know, well, we were, yeah, I mean, we were still at school at that point. Okay, yeah, no, we would have <laughs> been. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and yeah, and so look, so Colin, he doesn't believe her. Um, and he yes, says on that bike. he has, yeah, he has no intention of giving in to what he called empty threats. Um, That's right. And yeah, and he, he's kind of just as blunt with her as she is with him. Um, now she smiles at him um, mm. in quite a, a sort of an odd uh, fashion and simply says that he's made a mistake in not complying with her request um, and that another visitor would appear and, yes. that, and that's that's all she, that's all she says and she and she leaves she just gives um, a, she gives a, an emotionless smile yeah so and we all know Almost what like they look just, like yeah exactly Almost like it was just <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All the fellas out there yeah. know exactly what that looks like. <laughs> you know where they come from, yeah. yeah. Um, go on, go out. Exactly. Do what you like. Do what you like. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So late at night, a few a few days later, um, Colin is 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 in bed, and he happens to sort of see a red-eyed snarling gargoyle like creature um but basically lurking over him uh, at the foot of his bed um it's yeah it's just kind of looming or like hovering over him um and he, he can't do he can't do anything it doesn't do anything to him it doesn't say anything all it does is let out a a, a, a wailing type like sort of screech, screech or a wow, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, and and this is where the first sort of mention of the a potential banshee um, is uh, mm. is mentioned out of all, all of the encounters. I think this is the first one that kind of that draws that reference. Um, yeah, which going by the description and the the screech um, in which. Uh, they they mention it is very much certainly from what I know, which is fairly very limited at this point. It's uh, banshee like, yeah, it's that there's, territory. So it's, it's kind of in and around that area of. Mm. The type there of was Christian. a story that we mentioned before. Um, I believe it was on the Mothman episode about um, the soldiers out in Vietnam, and they witnessed um, right. yeah, before the a dam wind collapsed. That, um, it was the dam collapse, wasn't it, in Vietnam? Was it the dam collapse, the one in Vietnam? I'm talking about the one where they this winged creature starts flying above their head. And it's okay. female. It's mm. female in form. 
except mm. it looks like it hasn't got any bones in its arms. Yeah. Um, now, th- th- this is something that Nick Redfern also tried. He, he seems to find a connection with that mm. on this creature as well. Yeah, but there's exactly. There's a rich history of these black winged creatures with red eyes um, that seem to be about. Now, did you notice with this one that very much, I don't know if you, how much you know about sleep paralysis and sleep paralysis demons. I mean, thankfully, nothing personally, but yeah, a lot of that stuff has cropped up in pretty much all the research I've done since mm. pretty much the Bigfoot episode, to be honest, in, yeah. in some shape or form. Um, and so, yeah, again, especially with Colin Perk's uh, account, it, it definitely seems to have that type of vibe. Of, that he couldn't yeah. really move or, or anything like that. It just he could just see this thing. He couldn't at the react to of his it bed. other than just observe it. Yeah, and kind yeah, of which yeah, sounds like sleep do. paralysis. Which it sounds it, like it. He doesn't mention yeah. it specifically, but certainly from his account, or certainly how it's retold in the in the book, is that yeah, it it certainly falls into that kind of that category. It certainly mm. has that vibe about it. Um, it might coincide with her saying to him, "Stop." looking into all realms of the paranormal now we know that sleep paralysis is a a paranormal phenomenon Mm. so we know i guess there's a lot of people that think that is the case very strongly because we don't really understand what sleep paralysis is there's a lot Mm. of um, mainstream scientists that just go well yeah a dream like hypnagogic state is what they call it yeah hypnagogic state where you hallucinate and you see these demons sitting on your chest whilst yeah. you're, you know, technically your body's asleep, but your mind's not. Mm. And um, so, but I did find that that was quite interesting. And even yeah, Colin exactly, Burks yeah. goes on to, he goes on to say that he thinks that this winged gargoyle beast thing that was at the foot of his bed and yeah. the woman in black are one of the two things, one of the same, basically. Yeah, I think it was he said it was either the same woman that was at his door that had shapeshifted into this creature to kind of add a bit of weight to her message, or it was a demon sent there by the woman in black. Um, hmm. Either way they are, he believes that they are connected in, in yeah, some shape or form, which is, um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty terrifying either way. I think well, he... whether it's her or someone that she's summoned, yeah. pretty unsettling. It seems like there's a bit of a bit of a, a thing with regards to those sort of creatures as well, because um, yes. unfortunately he he did pass. Um, I'm not entirely sure how long after this particular encounter it was, but no. he's no longer with us. No. Um, so I suppose that's where a lot of people are maybe drawing from the banshee thing. The banshee is supposed to appear and scream. Um, in okay. Irish folklore, at the very least, that it screams the name of the person that's supposed to go. Um, yeah. And in Welsh, they have the 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 uh, ribbon, yeah, is what they call it. Um, and it's, it's even it's a it's a term that's even used today, which I found was quite funny. And it's okay. to describe a particularly ugly woman. They <laughs> they say <laughs> they say she's ugly like a cracker ribbon. Can, I'm yeah, not going to do a Welsh accent because I'm not very no. good at it. So no. Uh, no accents today, people, I'm afraid. No. No, no. <laughs> Copeland's out today, God. thankfully. So. She looked like a grappy ribbon. <laughs> hey. good, good attempt, I like that. Very good. Yeah, there you go. I had to give it a go. Yeah, I, and, I, and yeah, as you say, I, mean, I can't see that going down well as a, as a chat-up line. But uh, yeah, it certainly draws <laughs> comparisons to the Welsh and um, Irish uh, sort of versions of uh yeah the sort of the, the, the banshee or you know banshee like uh creature so um mm. yes yeah, so it's, it's probably certainly from what i saw it seems to be or heard sorry is the kind of the first um encounter where they try and link the two together or, or use that as a reference based on yeah it, it does crop up a couple of times as we'll as we'll go through in, in yeah. the following encounters but uh yeah i thought that was quite quite interesting because again it, it it draws itself to a theory that we also had for the the black eyed children, um, yeah. that also lends itself to to this, and also it's creepy as hell. <laughs> it whether it's indeed. a banshee or a sleep paralysis demon, or whether they're one of the same, it's um, mm. it's pretty terrifying. And yeah, you know, as you say, that they're drawing comparisons between 
Colin's passing and that encounter as being, uh, you know, as being linked. To, although he, I think he only documented that it was a, a screech or a wail. He, he didn't, he couldn't hear any, any, any name or like words that. or names or mm. you know or, or anything like that. So that, that's probably the only bit that that, that, that kind of doesn't support that. But otherwise, yeah. you know, you've got all the you've got all the criteria there, really. Um, well, I mean, sticking with the the paranormal know. sort of route. Um, yeah. This kind of takes us a bit full circle back to uh, Mr. Albert Bender, I think. It does, it? yes. Albert K. Now, Bender, yes. If, if you haven't listened to our Men in Black episode, we go into... Then why not? Uh, Albert, yeah, get, get, except, yeah. <laughs> firstly, why the hell not? Firstly, yeah. <laughs> why are you at number yeah. eight? What you are you doing? Yeah. To, what was it, number <laughs> yeah. four, I believe it was? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are you doing, mate? Go back. Go have a listen. Just pause it here. As long as this is going to make sense. <laughs> Skip back. Yeah, get yeah. back to it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so he, if you haven't listened to that, go and listen to it. And uh, we go into his story in a lot of detail. Um, yes, we do, yeah. Uh, th- three Men and Flying Saucers, I think it was. Yeah. Um, his book that he wrote. Now, he's, his family actually has um, a, a history of encounters with a woman in black. That's now, right. even though Bender's accounts with the men in black started in the early 50s, mm. the woman in black encounters started in the 1930s. And it wasn't to him, uh, yeah. fortunately, it was actually to his younger cousin. That's right. Yeah. Now, he was told this these stories by his mum. Yeah. Um, so bedtime stories. It's a, it's right. some nice yeah. scary stories about what happened to your cousin. Yeah, yeah so, they were the types but, of uh, stories that he got, which probably set him on the path to where he ended up with yeah, creating know, his chamber of horrors. His own... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So his um, his cousin's story of a woman in black, um, it starts off with um, the young lad always wearing a coin around his neck um, okay. on an unbroken chain, right, and kind of a bit like Frodo in the ring, really. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, but he never took it off. He never took it off. Right. He always wore it when he was bathing, swimming, sleeping. Yeah. Um, it's kind of his and precious. And they noticed... <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's, he's precious. <laughs> <laughs> but he, um, he start, his health started to decline. And um, hmm. they couldn't really understand uh, any particular reason as to why it was declining. Doctors couldn't find out. Um, it was racking the mum and dad's brains. You know, so what's going on with him? They didn't know what was happening. Um, and then he started saying to them that there was this woman in black that comes into his room. Mm. And they was like, oh, it's, it's just the, the stories that they've told about the old girl who lived in the mine, because apparently their house was opposite an old opposite mine. Opposite used mine, yeah. Well, he was only six as well, so I think they put a lot of it down to his age and overactive imagination. And I'm listening to these stories. I mean, the story of this yeah. this woman was quite a tragic one, was that yeah. um, horrifying, she... Pretty really? Yeah, yeah, it really is. So th- it goes that she was um, very much a, a spinster, as they would say, mm-hmm. like an older woman that didn't have a husband. Well, or I she believe she was to... a witch, didn't they? She. Well, yeah, they would have done. Any, any woman that witch. wasn't... Yeah. yeah, any spinster would have been mm-hmm. accused of being a witch, especially if she yeah. had, like, say, a dozen cats around her. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. this woman reportedly did. Mm. Um, for one thing led to another, and she couldn't hold on to life anymore. And no. she ended up um, drawing a knife across her throat and throwing herself into one of the disused shafts within the mine. That's right. Um, and when they, you know, they found her body, they brought it all up, and mm. uh, you know, the 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 story of the woman in black persisted. Yeah, and it well, just so happened that. that but... Sorry, just to cut in. Yeah, go on. That the that her body, when it was finally recovered, was actually kept in the house that Bender's family then moved into years later, whilst they were preparing her body to obviously take her to you know crematorium or uh, you know a morgue or whatever the process would have been at that point. So yeah, they they believed that the this the sort of spooky goings on was because the the woman's body got taken to that house because it was directly opposite Mm. the mine. Even even at that time when it was in use, cool. so they just they just dropped her off at the first first place. Pretty much, oh, that was it. It was to prepare her to move her to the local graveyard. So they stored her body in that house oh, until the blimey. graveyard was ready for her to uh, to be moved. So yes, yeah, so I think that's where it 
ultimately came it from. Yeah, would have been a good couple of days at the very least. You know, I don't know how quite possibly how efficient yeah. those exactly. grave diggers were. Well, exactly. Yeah, really? it could have been hours or it could have been days, but yeah, certainly long mm. enough for there to be an unsettling feeling. Yeah, absolutely. So this yeah. this young lad um, complained about having a woman in black in his room, and that would scare him. Um, so they, his parents just left it up to his imaginations and, and such. Yeah. And, well, they uh, thought it was nonsense. I think in the account, I think they actually used the word nonsense. They thought it was just a load of rubbish. Yeah, it's a load of rubbish. They didn't believe him. Yeah. Mm. And uh, until one day, he, well, one evening, should I say, mm. he screamed out, screamed out, and his mum and dad come running in, and he actually had hand marks around his neck. Yeah. And he screamed about. Um, the, the the woman in black was choking him and trying to take his coin. That's right. Yeah, um, and she had the chain. He had the pattern from the chain embedded in his um, in his neck, as well. along yeah. with along with the the Pressure hand marks, marks from, as well. Yeah. So right. he, his mum and dad were actually like, "Well, hang on a second, this this is getting pretty bad. Maybe he's done it to himself. He's pulled it or something like that." So we're just going to sit in the room with him until that just make sure that he's okay he's mm. going to sleep and such so they start just sitting there watching him he nods off he goes to sleep and yeah. then in their half dreamlike state themselves were there almost nodding off dad notices a bit of movement in the room mm. and he sees a black figure or a pale figure should i say yeah clad in black um glide across the room Toward the bed that has his son in, That's and right, yeah. as well, he's, he's watching it, almost. Sorry, go on. Sorry, man. I was just going to say this all came from, you know, a, a number of accounts where he would wake up screaming himself, claiming to have heard a wailing scream from this woman who, for the most part, would just stand in the corner of, of his room. And it was only on this last in, encounter, because um, I think when the parents run into the room, um, the chain was broken off uh from around his neck the pattern was embedded in his uh in his skin um and i think the coin was next to him off the chain but on the that's on right the it was pillow. on the pillow yes. yeah um yeah sorry and, you're right i didn't i did miss that bit out yeah and he uh so you obviously claimed that she was choking him that she was trying to take his coin now they called mm. a local doctor in the hope that he would be able to like help um but he said it was nothing more than childhood nightmares no. and discounted the claims as, as being anything but um, such a stupid child yeah exactly uh, and then that's mind. when yeah exactly um and then that's when it yeah it also ties into the encounter that's that, when they decided to because, sit in his room and well they and... basically said you know enough was enough and they opted to sleep in his room until the situation improved i.e if it was nightmares they wanted him to feel comfortable enough that the nightmares would stop um yeah. so that's why they slept in the room and then yeah then well, yeah you'd sorry do goes for, into... you'd do that for your kid wouldn't you you really would you would and yeah if it was that just bad, goes to you show would... you that maybe they're a bit more responsible than say albert's mum who's telling yeah, exactly scary telling stories <laughs> story yeah exactly <laughs> no nightmares yeah. for you okay yeah, exactly yeah. you want sleep but, no it's overrated but yeah so <laughs> um yeah so dad actually does wake up and he witnesses this pale figure gliding across the floor, all clad in black. And he in his dreamlike state, he's like he's not noticed. What is that? What is, that? is that just a trick of my eye? And then he sees a pale white hand come out from it, the bony, bony hand. Yeah, that's right. Reaching toward his kid's neck. That's right. Again, um, trying to go for the, the coin. Going for the coin again. Yeah. So he jumps up, he lights a candle and thrusts it into this figure's face. face yeah and it was a this gold like this sunken eyed sunken cheek dead pale looking thing Very gaunt chalky skin yeah, yeah sunken dark um eyes and it was shocked it was shocked that he had seen it and mum yeah. had woken up by this point as well and she had got up and she could see yeah. it and this thing looked at him looked at her looked back at him screamed and then yeah. just disappeared yeah but also taking the coin with it yeah That's and then right. after that it never appeared to them again well because i don't think it was if 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 i've 
got this uh if i've got this right they never actually um because they move out returned, after a week. yeah <laughs> and i was gonna say they they actually moved out of the house didn't they within a week that's, of that happening that's but, good like, grounds no, no, that's good uh, grounds to move that one yeah. Pack up the house. We are off. <laughs> I wonder if um, uh, that was before the law came in, in uh, the federal law in America, where you have to declare if your house is haunted. I can't imagine so. Otherwise, every house in America would have been bloody haunted, wouldn't it? Honestly, no one, no one honestly, would buy you, your have, soul. Yeah. you have to declare it out there. I'd imagine you would, yeah. I it's you it's would, crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, th yeah. I think that's absolutely crazy that you have to declare whether your house is haunted or not before well, you sell people, it. People believe it, you know, that much. And yeah. the way that you know, Americans like to sue each other. You know, if you sold your house and didn't declare it, you'd only get sued anyway. So you might as well give people a heads up. You know, but there's a but there's the a event. bit of a bit of a paradox though, because surely the belief of it perpetuates the event. Well, because that seems to be what the case is at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what a lot of people are taking note of. So maybe you've got a house full of people who really, really don't believe it, have nothing happen, and then yeah. Well, it Someone was, else moves in who very much believes it, and all this shit starts. The blood's dripping out of the walls, the whole shebang. Well, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so <laughs> you know, this is obviously another tie into obviously previous episode, and, and not only that, but previous individual. Although it didn't directly involve uh, Albert Bender, it was his young cousin, um, mm. and he's actually kind of credited his cousin's experiences with the woman in black uh, to his. Um, obsession with alchemy which you'll see all things yes. kind of gold and and coins um and that it was that belief um that that basically life can be created or recreated through science and the transference of life force which i think is where the use of the uh coins well, this is uh, comes this is in. the thing about alchemy yeah. alchemy in it in the material sense is um taking say a base metal like lead and yeah. through alchemy, turning it into a precious metal like gold. Like gold, yeah. Now, there have been many stories over the years of men in black doing just that. Mm. Um, taking, well, they did it to Bender, they, didn't they? They gave him the well, coin. They've got, a very, they've, got, they've got an obsession with coins. They've made yeah. coins appear and disappear. <laughs> Not necessarily like, um, like a magician would, like with sleight of hand, but no. they hold the coin in their hand and the coin sort of dissolves. dissolves. It just a bit like the snap in uh, ceases to in Avengers. It, it kind of dissipates yeah, into like a dust away. in front of them. No, I think that's 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 pretty much how it's been. Um, you know, that's pretty much how it's been described. But it's used as a mm. threat, isn't it? Because they've said, look, look, look what happens to this coin if you don't stop. It's what gone you're somewhere. Doing, this will happen to you, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. and we can't. This coin has gone somewhere else, yeah. and you'll go there. Yeah. If you continue to to persist, yeah, exactly. And yeah, yes. His Albert Bender's favorite book was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and the whole idea of the elixir of life, um, which in I itself think. is a, it's it's an allegory really for internal alchemy, mm. yeah, and exactly, that yeah. would be internal alchemy essentially would be spiritual immortality. So yes, precisely. Yeah. That's what that's what a lot of um buddhist monks um that they tend to practice that spiritual balance that That's find the, the whole idea of finding the chakras and having them all in line that in itself is what you would call internal alchemy um and because of his deep ties to alchemy bender likely knew a lot more about the woman in black than had previously known um, well, it's the thing he didn't let on in his own... previously thought, really, because of the yeah. the connection of that coin. There's there is why yeah. we don't know what the metal was. was on that coin. No, no, we don't know. But it seems like women in black and men in black, in particular, mm. they have a bit of an obsession with with coins. Um, and it is something, as, as we know as well, it's something that came up in his men in black experiences, where he would use a coin like. Piece he, was, of metal he was given a coin sort of thing wasn't he by a, to contact yeah these beings well so and that's what um he also says uh sparked his uh sort of desire to create the chamber of horrors because he was trying to create a portal to another realm in the hope that he could communicate with the women in black ideally the one that visited his cousin 
to find mm. out what you know kind of her purpose was what the intention was you know why they have such an interest in um in alchemy basically yeah um and because there, there really is i mean i don't i'm guessing you haven't really looked into alchemy or anything like that and i've done I a little no. i know a little bit about it nothing massive or anything like that but there there seems to be something about it because there was also again going along the alchemy sort of route there was another story that cropped up in in nick's book in nick redfern's book about um a woman in black encounter where yeah. she asked is there any au around here now yeah exactly yeah anyone that does know on the um periodic table yeah i know now <laughs> symbol for gold is au it is yeah so there is and also there's plenty of stories um from like origin stories of ancient cultures mm. like for instance um the sumerians yeah their ancient their their origin story was that they were created by the anunnaki which were the the gods that came from the sky mm. um and the whole purpose of being created was so that we mined gold for the anunnaki so humans were created in order to mine gold for these these creatures yeah exactly um there's also i forget the name of the culture but there's one in south africa as well as a tribe of people that say exactly the same thing and now they're separated geographically mm. by thousands of miles yeah exactly um, yeah but i believe also similar relevance there's another what I, I don't know it's not the hopi but i'm sure there is another tribe in north america that said right. the same sort of thing so it seems like if we are looking down the extraterrestrial sort of route with these yeah. and the alchemy sort of thing. Mm. I mean, alchemy is incredibly interesting. It um, certainly is, yeah. Then I can understand why he might have been, Obsessed might have had a, himself, maybe a, yeah. a mild obsession with alchemy because yeah. there seems to be a lot that ties into it. Well, exactly, yeah. I mean, his, his cousin had his own experience only the age of six with the relevance of, you know, of this coin that was around his neck. And then Bender, when he was older, um, when the men in black visited him, he had his own interaction with a, a mm. coin and, and how that was relevant to communication. Um, so, yeah, you can see where his obsession uh, came from. Um, that's for sure. Um, now, talking about previous uh, sort of subjects, um, the, the next uh, encounter, um, Certainly for me, I don't know how you felt about it, Scott, but certainly had a, a valiant Thor kind of it really ring did. to it in terms of the, <laughs> the kind of the fantastical, uh, you know, almost romant romanticized uh, oh, space fabrication. Baby. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, fabrication <laughs> of a of an encounter. Now, I suppose you know, disclaimer: this is definitely a geezer who was cheating on his missus and he got caught and he had to think of something to get out of it. That, that was definitely, that, that was the first thing that popped into my head. Well, no, I, do you know what? I'll give him credit. speculation. I'm not, you know, accusing him of anything. I don't give I'll give it. Oh, you know, I'll give him all the credit in the world because there is no way I could come up with something like this. No, you know, I mean, like, no, I mean, Gemma where would have you fucking, been? Gemma would look through uh, this. Yeah, uh, she'd see through it and she'd be like, I'll piss off. <laughs> I've, I've been in a flying saucer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got seduced yeah. by a little alien. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, He's, yeah, you wouldn't get far. Uh, well, I, I certainly wouldn't. But yeah. um, this, uh, this involves a, a guy in California in 1898 by the name of Truman Bethurum um, in the... Uh, Mopa Valley area um, of, of, of California. Mo Mormon Massa, I think, is the particular mountain range that he was uh, he was climbing at the time. Um, now his reason his reason for climbing it is because his wife likes shells, and yep. he was there specifically to collect them because they're found in that particular uh, area. Um, now during his hike he was stopped in his tracks by a, a UFO, essentially, which descended mm. and landed in, in, in front of him. Um, and a small uh, sort of group of, of aliens, um, you know, exited the, the craft. They were about four feet in height um, with mm. a humanoid-looking um, alien 
with them who also exited the uh, the craft and they instantly began um speaking with him now they claim to have come from far away um and this is where it kind of draws the valiant thor fingers again it, and, and almost like um injured cold as well um they claim to have come from a far away planet called clarion uh, or clarion um yeah i read it as clarion or clarion clarion, clarion. And their leader, uh, who is the, the humanoid, uh, was, uh, so he went by the name Captain Ara Reigns, mm. which, whether, whether it's nonsense or not, I think that's a really cool name. It is, yeah. <laughs> so if he's, fought, if he's come up with it, then kudos for coming up with it, because it's a super cool yeah. name. Um, that's just the aspiring author in me kind of looking at it thinking <laughs> yeah. yeah that's a killer oh, name for an alien I come up with that one Shit. yeah yes beat me to it um now well, i think just, that also might be sorry i, I, I think that on. might be uh the the accent of the woman that narrated the the book because yeah. i found the spelling it's spelled as aura a-u-r-a oh, right see i've written it down so, as aura is it a-r-a like yeah, no, it's aura rains. Aura rains. Yeah, that's, okay. that's how the, us British might say it. As Brits would but, uh, butcher it, yeah. Yeah. But okay. yeah, apparently that, that was her name. Oh, um, and okay. she seemed to be certainly the taller of the lot, but no more than five foot tall. No, she, yeah. So she was, only a, she was only a bit taller, but yeah, she, she was more humanoid, um, mm. whereas the others but were. I do like his description aliens. of her, though. No, oh, well, this is where his story unraveled for me already, and I was like, "Straight yeah, away, all right, here we go. You've lost me already, <laughs> mate. You've you've been collared here." <laughs> yeah. Um, she was a shapely, beautiful woman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. I'm like, okay. Now we now we're getting into the real story. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. So, so yeah. So a shapely, beautiful woman. Um. And. Yeah, he, he goes on to say that him and Captain Rains would have, uh, yeah, would have regular meetings in the desert at night in the middle of Nevada. I mean, alarm bells. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> they uh, they would talk about you know the Cold War and problems that the Earth were either going through or were going to be going through, which for me drew comparisons to. Uh, to injured cold as that was his proposed purpose yeah. was to stop the cold war um, and valiant thor as well and uh, and valiant thor as well yeah he was there his sole purpose was to prevent it and to yeah talk about earth and how he could help earth be better um mm. so that certainly yeah i mean i don't know when... well it seems like a lot of the contactees in the 1950s had that sort of mo that modus operandi yeah that kind of that, yeah yeah that sort of like the purpose and also, the foundation again, for the story wasn't it again these are christian aliens as well that's something that i found out that they were christian aliens christian aliens christian aliens right okay right? i missed that and my, uh... oh it's, it's brilliant mate um brilliant. he was uh where have i got it i've got it right here he was entrusted by the extraterrestrials Right. to um, start uh, to create a place of learning. Okay. And uh, for those that were interested in the possibility of flying saucers. Now, right. and he was supposed to be the leader. So right. this sounds very much along the lines of, so uh, it seems like... This is like Thor and Frank Strangers, yeah. isn't it? Because Frank Strangers... These Christian also, aliens have asked religious. you to start a cult yeah sure yeah sure sure they have it just seems like that seems to be and he also stated as well right that he had physical evidence of extraterrestrial existence Mm. that he never produced no you know maybe like say a photograph yeah exactly yeah it was august of uh yeah 1952 so yeah again if it's physical evidence then where's the you know the photographs you know that's what i would certainly uh, yeah. expect um especially because she took the you know she took the typical appearance or almost typical appearance of uh of the women in black um but this time she wore a, a black beret um sunglasses uh black uh, blouse but a red skirt wasn't it or a red a red dress right. that was the only element that wasn't black apparently there's a red skirt and that was the um encounter that 
because he he confided as uh, supposedly confided in very few people as to what he was you know he confided in everyone but his wife basically yeah seems basically. to be the case um took a mate on one occasion him, yeah. yeah he went yeah. they went to a diner they finished up their night shift and they went to a oh, diner yeah. and yeah. his his mate whitey mm. um kind of gave him a little bit of a nudge and went is that her over there well because like, he, he, um Bethurum had already told his mate at work about the encounter. I think at the time, his, his mate Whitey, as you say, just kind of laughed it off and was like, oh, you know, you're going nuts. You know, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, yeah. but then something about this woman's appearance, you know, struck him enough that, yeah, as you say, he gave uh, mm. Truman a, a sort of a nudge and was like, that's her, isn't it? Yeah. She was with her, it, Apparently, daughter. she was supposed to be um, quite short quite shapely um and she supposedly had um almost like a latino like slight right. latino sort of yeah. look to her face going back to the olive skinned or latina even. uh yeah the olive skinned uh, sort of trait that we found in mm. yeah sort of the black eyed children and the, the men in black but this um this particular encounter that he that he, that he reports is very different from you know hopping out to the desert and jumping on the saucy saucer you know, it's, <laughs> it's she kind of um, she kind of gives him the old uh, black widow treatment, really. Like the, yeah. you know, he goes over to his says, oh, Aura, Aura, um, you know, it, it's me, and, and she's kind of just giving him the blank stare of, you like who? Don't know who you are. We've never um, met. Yeah, we've never met. Oh, fobbing him off. And um, what's weird as well is the person that she was with. There was a, another male who was yeah. of similar height to her. So, again, no more mm. than five foot tall. Um, didn't even acknowledge that Batherum was there or that Batherum was talking or no, just nothing at no, all. Yeah. Yeah. No recognition. No recognition. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like that. Um, yeah. And there was another time when he spotted her walking mm. in a, on a busy street That's and right. uh, he called out, Lady, Lady. Like this and she turned around and looked directly at him yeah now he says that you know the the sidewalk was very very populated at that point so someone shouting out lady could have come from anywhere and she turned around and stared at him and just slowly shook her head like mm. it's not the right time not or, now or yeah something. well the other thing um, with that diner encounter was that the was that they they saw the that they saw the two sitting at the end of the table where they were at the at the diner um and he's trying to you know prove that it's her and saying you know we met the other night you know up, up in the desert you know we spoke and blah 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 and she like sort of fobs him off and she's like no I, I don't know don't know what you're talking about they slowly get up from the the table and and essentially go to exit the the diner so Truman thinks nothing of it and carries on his friend Whitey had already left the diner to have a, a cigarette and he's, I think he's perched against the bonnet of someone's car, having a having a smoke. Um, Truman, Tr I think Truman meets him uh, a few moments later, um, and the male of the the two um, approaches Truman and says uh, she did she didn't want to say anything in front of your friend, but yes, she does remember you, mm. or something like that. And that's all he says, and then he walks off. Yeah, um, which is. And then when he's a bit weird mate, in itself, well, it's, as well, it's very right? odd. Like, why wouldn't you just acknowledge that you'd that you'd sort of met him? You know, why why would that be one? Yeah, you know, why would that be one thing that you would sort of deny out of the whole out of the whole thing? Unless, of course, Bethlehem was shitting himself because someone walked in who looked exactly like the woman he described, and old mate is gone. Is that her? That's got to well, be her. her isn't it? You've, yeah. you've, you've told me that's what that's exactly what she looks you like. Described her, bang on. Yeah, that's got to be her. And he's gone. Oh shit! I've got to go and talk to her now. <laughs> yeah. And that's why yeah, she's gone. That. I don't know you, Who are you? because yeah. I don't know you. <laughs> well, that would have. Yeah, I mean, that would have definitely worked. I mean, this bit might have been added just to try and add credence to the story, but. Mm. But yeah, as, obviously, as they're walking out the diner, the the the, the male of the two, the men in the man in black, turns and says uh, to Bethurum, which is the first thing he says in the whole encounter, um, something along the lines of "Yes, she does remember you," or "Yes, it was her," or something like that. He joins yeah. her at the door of the diner, and then they disappear. So he believes that they just left the diner, or whatever. 
he joins his mate Whitey outside who was having a cigarette, just kind of standing around waiting. Um, and he says, oh, like, did you see him leave the diner? Like, how weird was that? And he was like, what are you talking about? They haven't left the diner. Yeah. And he was no like, one's yeah, walked through that door apart from you. And he was like, yeah, they just walked out. Yeah. And he says, like, no, you're no one's walked out since since you or before you. So, um, yeah, so that was very, yeah, that was very creepy. And I say it was around the time of the, yeah, so I've got me, me dates wrong. But yeah, it was around the time of, um, yeah, sort of the early 50s. So very much around the same time as Valiant 4. Um, well, that was also in the UFO flap that was going on at that time. Yeah, at that time and that as, as well. well. Yeah. So there was, again, kind of UFO and yeah. high strangeness, men in black, women in black. It, it was up to at be. the, yeah. High end of the yeah. Richter scale, wasn't it? Something that, was uh, happening. Something really was happening then. Um, it was. A lot of people, were, a lot of people, especially at the time, were attributing it to the introduction of atomic weaponry. Mm. I say it's a good enough. That's a good enough uh, explanation for it, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. One, There's something odd. Well, one p- potential explanation, which I think you might be a fan of, and I'm not sure if you made a note of this or not, but mm. it's claimed that. Aura Reigns or Aura Reigns was actually a uh, sort of modern version of the British Fey Folk, um, yes. which I know we mentioned a little bit earlier, I think, but also in the previous Black Eyed Children uh, episode, um, and that mm. she was sent to Earth to deliberately intimidate and seduce men um, in order to, in order that they would give up intel uh, and important information about Earth that she could then report Absolutely. back. It to, does, uh, it? superiors, which is a, a sort of a trait of you know the faith. Folk. It's not all sort of, yeah, well, that's where lost the... boys, it's uh, no <laughs> far more sinister. The thing that popped well, into my head actually well... was Species, the film Species, yeah, <laughs> it was almost that type of thing, yeah. We come to come to earth to uh, yeah. to breed, to come to breed um, and populate, yeah, yeah, which is um, which is a, a common theme with regards to alien films, anyway. I mean, just take alien. For, for that matter oh yeah exactly you yeah, know impregnating yeah impregnating you in some way but yeah, yeah exactly, you're right yeah. i did like i did like the the way nick redfern did kind of try and join aura reigns into yeah. the faith folk because that in itself crops up in a lot of cases you know there's various different mm. things from sirens and mermaids um there was yeah exactly uh, yeah oh there was uh some uh, there was another dina she that was mm. Um, I can't remember its name now, but it was a she that did exactly okay. the same sort of thing, um, yeah. which is a common sort of thing. And I suppose if she's sort yeah. of diminutive as well, you know, yeah. no more That's than right. five foot tall, then I guess they must say, oh, she must sense. be a little fairy or something. Well, the other thing that Bethurum does say with these encounters is that although she was sometimes kind of a bit, what he would say was uh, flirty, for the most part, she, the encounters were always quite sort of hostile. Mm. which again uh although i don't again know too much at this point with the the kind of the, the fey folk that's again quite a, a well it seems like he hostility he and, had uh, a couple of close encounters of the you know what kind of, of that kind river. yeah well that's why i mentioned well, that's, that's what certainly what he uh so that's what he claims reported anyway. yeah, yeah that's what he that's what he claims bless him yeah, space babes but, <laughs> space babes yeah exactly well that's again well that's that's exactly why i mentioned species because that as soon as i sort of listened to the end of that encounter and and his claims of the you know kind of um intergalactic hanky panky um that's what uh that's what came to mind was that film <laughs> intergalactic hanky panky <laughs> love it <laughs> <laughs> if we named it if we gave titles to our episodes i suppose that would be it wouldn't it but yeah uh, yeah we, we have to do a little sub note sub intergalactic yeah, women in black intergalactic hanky panky <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah the, the mysterious brilliant. companions of the men in black in their intergalactic hanky panky <laughs> <laughs> there you go nick you're welcome there you go yeah yeah you're welcome yeah yeah thanks for that yeah um but no that was one again i picked that one or we picked that one sorry because mm. it was again it was it was the most compelling out of out of it, it was it was interesting it did make me laugh um yeah. and it also did draw sort of heavy comparisons for me with the valiant thor encounter that obviously we went over yeah back in what episode five i think it was um so yeah and i thought that it was quite 
intriguing that again you know we've got a different you know uh planet you know we've had venus we've had lanulose now we've got clarion yeah uh, or, or clarion um you know injured cold valiant thor we've now got our reigns so are we now mm-hmm. starting to put together a bit of a you know guardians of the galaxy sort of mishmash <laughs> of uh you know sort of individuals so yeah i just well, thought we added a bit of sort of all here to spread the word of god exactly so, all, uh, all here to yeah conveniently christians assemble spread the word of the same god yeah considering they're supposedly from light years away but yeah that's a Who that's a that's, that's, that's a whole different episode but unfortunately like uh strangers the theorem gets absolutely ripped apart online Oh um, yeah, people don't believe it. He just gets absolutely destroyed with the. It's when he it's when he gets to the the description of a uh, the flirtatious sort of banter almost that they have, and then mm-hmm. the fact that he, he claims that they have, you know, mated, hopped on the good foot and did the bad thing. Exactly right. Yeah, it's uh, it's when he gets to those points that I think he really starts to lose people, and and that's I mean that's where he he lost me because I was like, yeah, all right, mate, yeah, yeah come on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just starting to sound like uh, old. Yeah. Mills and Boone a yeah, little exactly. bit. Like exactly. knock it yeah. off, will you? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a knock-off Mills and Boone novel, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah there so was, that was um, that. And again, it just shows the hmm. potential. Although this was this is kind of drawing more comparisons to kind of, you know, fey folk, based on her persona, her attitude, her appearance you know, again, you know, she sort of certainly fits into that women in black MO, um, you know, and also with her intentions, you know, finding information about us and, you know, about earth and, you know, kind of whatever else. So, but, so we end that uh, encounter there in uh, Mopa Valley, California. Um, we, we came back across the pond to the, the UK, you know, a little bit in the eighties. Um, but uh I want to stick it into the the 1950s 1955 is where uh you know is where this one uh sort of originates um and we're we're back in uh, we're back in the UK um an MI5 agent um is uh, is included in this one yeah so this encounter involves a Mr Brian Kingersley now it's his grandfather who was the MI5 agent and in 1955, his grandfather was part of uh, an investigation into a man who claimed to have had an encounter with a a human-looking alien. Now, the, the man being investigated was a major figurehead in the British military. Um, he was poised to basically press the red button on our nuclear warheads in the Cold War, should it have yeah, ever gone. Guy. Yeah, should have yeah, got, we to ever got to go to war with uh, the Soviets. Yeah, he was, was the guy. Close, to, really? Well, yeah, he was the guy that was made. You know, uh, you know that would he make the trusted. call in in hitting that red button. Um, so this was all um, obviously super kind of top secret at the time. So it was only in kind of the later years that various kind of names and departments were, you know, allowed to be uh, you know sort of shared or or, or mentioned. Um, now, the name of this guy that they were investigating was Air Marshal Sir Beresford Peter Torrington Halsley. It's quite a, a mouthful. Cool. Um, and in 19... Say? Exactly, yeah. Say that three times. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1954, he came face-to-face uh, with this humanoid alien that we sort of later found out was... Uh, who went by the name Mr. Janus. Or Mr. Janus. Um, first name, Hugh. First name. <laughs> you couldn't you could help yourself, could you? <laughs> Sorry, man. Sorry. <laughs> you couldn't help yourself. But yes, very good. Yeah. His name was yeah, Mr. Hugh Janus. Yeah, we yes. all know where that one came yeah, from. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Matt Gronin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, Horsley sort of got involved because he was essentially asked to work very closely with uh, the late Duke of Edinburgh, um, who reportedly had a fascination with UFOs. Now, it's it's reported that he he couldn't be seen to 
have a fascination with UFOs or, you know, want to look into anything of that, that nature for, you know, the good of the royal family and whatever else. So, so Horsley with his military background was basically drafted in to essentially continue the research on behalf of the, the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, now, an, another guy, another chap, uh, Sir Arthur Barnett, uh, sorry, Sir Arthur Barrett, um, who worked as a, a gentleman usher to the state, introduced Horsley to another figurehead in the British military, a General Martin, um, who in turn <laughs> introduced him to the elusive Mrs. Markham. Um, ah. Now, it's General Martin's belief that UFOs were visitors from another planet who were warning us against nuclear war, much like our arraigns, Martin Thor. Um, yeah. And so this, yeah, Mr. Janice apparently had the same intentions. Um, now, Sir Horsley was told to attend a, a meeting at an apartment in Chelsea in London um, where he was to meet a, a stranger, the aforementioned Mr. Janus. Um, now, allegedly, the apartment was on South Street in uh, in Chelsea, which belonged to this Mrs. Markham. We never find out kind of her full name, title, mm. or, or why or how she's involved, only that that's her name. Yeah. Um, now they 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 meet on this on this particular night, and this Mr. Janus, the humanoid alien, uh, questions Horsley on his knowledge of UFOs and his involvement um, in, in in yeah in like how he how he came to being involved in UFOs, considering his gotcha. background. So, so basically, he knew, give, he's, in, he's inducting him into like an interview sort of thing, like. Kind of, be almost like a grilling, like the census. Kind of, takers. yeah, pretty much like a grilling. So they knew what his involvement was, but they were kind of wanting him to confirm it because he had a distinct military background. How did he mm. end up looking into kind of UFOs? So this Mr. Janus wanted to um, sort of question that. Um, the feeling that Horsley says that he he got from from Janus was that he was there to observers and nothing more so there was nothing kind of threatening or you know or, or anything like that really um now he he believes that janus also tried to read his mind he doesn't know kind of what information he would have got from him uh, or how he knows but he just said he had a feeling in his head that it that someone, someone else, else was, was in, in there it. as well. Yeah, it was yeah. a bit fuzzy and a bit kind of, he just knew something was going on. And that's kind of the what he took from that feeling was that mm. um, Janus was trying to, yeah, sort of read his, uh, read his mind. Now, it, although it was never confirmed, it's also believed that this Mrs. Markham um, was also believed to be a female humanoid. Um, and it's a little bit her sort of involvement gets a bit weird, but the night before, so during the encounter between uh, Air Marshal Horsley and Mr. Janus, this Mrs. Markham, aside from offering up her apartment, has no other involvement in this encounter. She doesn't say anything. She doesn't really offer anything to it, really, that she kind of just lets them get on with it, but she's kind of the host, the, the yeah. introducer. Um, but the night before, um, so go on. No, I was just going to say it was almost like she, the attentions on on Mr. Janus, yes. so that she's in the background, maybe observing uh, Horsley, mm. just watching him, how yeah. he reacts, and like so. It's almost again, it's like mm. she's there in charge, but she's not. She's conducting the whole thing, but through someone else. For, yeah, almost like using a puppet on on her behalf, which kind of leads quite nicely into the, the sort of the next bit. So the first time that uh, Air Marshal Horsley actually meets Mrs. Markham is, as I say, the night before the meeting with, with Janus. Um, and he described, he he's basically at his apartment. Um, Mrs. Markham basically turns up, knocks on his door. Uh, he wasn't aware that he'd given his address out, so didn't know how she, you know, managed to find him. But mm. she sorry he described her as uh being very pale 
dressed in a long black thick coat with black heels and long black hair. She had a monotone voice and a rather expressionless face, which he even said fits that it into seemed the... like her hair was a wig as well. Yeah, again, it didn't look it's... natural, which would fit Same in again MO. with the whole women in black uh, MO. Um, now, Mrs. Markham claimed that the world was in danger of nuclear war at the hands of the Soviets. She wanted Horsley to get on board with other extraterrestrials and work together with this Mr. Janus to basically disarm the, the world of nuclear weapons. Um, now, he was very sceptical of, of kind of this intention from Mrs. Markham um, because he felt that although disarming the various countries of their nuclear weapons you know would be good for the world in terms of it not destroying itself his skepticism came from the fact that he then felt that it would leave the earth susceptible to attacks from elsewhere so he mm -hmm. then thought is she getting me to do this to basically weaken earth like so visitors bluff. from other planets can come and attack us quite easily um because up with like Valiant Thor in particular, he was quite concerned with the nuclear weapons. So was it a yeah. case of aliens disarming us for their own cause, but going about it in so much as you know trying to convince us that it was for our benefit? Yeah, that they you know almost like a that. like a gun amnesty, you know, like a, a yeah. nation Lay down giving your up their arms. Thing, yeah, you know because it's all for your safety. You know, yeah. so then the guns are off the streets, people. Yeah, you know, so we're the only ones with the guns. Then you know the government. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's happened a few times, mate. Yeah, no, exactly. And he, he, so he, he kind of um, he kind of communicates his scepticism to Mrs. Markham. Um, he says that he would still meet with with her friend at this time. He he hadn't been given a name or anything. But he said he'd he'd meet with the uh, yeah he, he'd he'd meet with the the individual. Um, he'd still discuss the matter further, um, but he had no interest in actually employing that tactic um it was then that she uh she sort of stood up smiled and left his apartment um again not saying anything else now much like um the earlier encounter um he's laying in bed and he's awoken by a wailing scream um from that of a female spirit which he believed was specifically a banshee um, sent to deliver a message of misfortune. That was his kind of vibe. Um, I don't think he describes again any, um, you know, kind of words or, you know, anything anything like that, really. Um, yeah. he, again, it was just a wailing scream that kind of woke him up in the early hours. But this was the same night that he interacted with mrs markham as opposed to so, a few days later that happened to um to the you know the, the chap earlier um colin Perks. Perks. yeah so again very similar in terms of how they were woken what they were woken by that it was a female figure you know he says it was more like a spirit like a banshee but then you know a banshee does take on that form which was also described by perks mm -hmm. so um yeah, so again, I wanted to just kind of brush over that. Again, if, if anyone wants to deep dive into that more, then obviously pick up Redfern's book because he goes oh, yeah. into Great kind of book. a lot more detail. A lot of it's kind of filler and a bit fluffy and you don't really need to know it for the context of the the encounter. Um, but again, it's it's a, it's a, another encounter with a you know, fabled woman in black um, turning quite threatening and sinister to achieve her end game to convince people to kind of fall in line and do what you know she wants them you know to do now whether Janus was a puppet being controlled by Markham or whether they were basically a man and woman in black taking on these personas um it was never really it was never really detailed or, or kind of confirmed really it, they've just kind of agreed that these individuals were odd um you know they were you know sort of quite peculiar it seems like as well that i don't think we've really mentioned it much with regards to the, the encounters that we've gone over is that that same overwhelming feeling of dread 
that comes across when they interact with these women. Um, it's not yes. necessarily just the, the looks and their behavior, but it's the energy that they're picking up on that's emanating from these people, from these women, that nothing, it, it, to, on paper, if we just say it as it is, like we cut, like we have done, yeah. it's there's nothing really, anything particularly it's too scary or anything like that. But if you've ever had that cold, dead stare mm. that someone might give, not just a woman, but anyone yeah. in general, it is incredibly unnerving. Like you look in the eyes it of is. a killer, like some of those SAS guys you get on the TV. Yeah. The, they've got there's something in their eyes dead stare yeah there's just nothing something in their the eyes, eyes sort of thing yeah it's like the way a bear might look at you like can i eat yeah. that you yeah know, which exactly. is yeah. terrifying yeah. because it just doesn't care you know it's no. you are literally insignificant and what i like about nick redfern's book is he he doesn't try and push one particular theory mm. at all you know we, we've discussed it earlier on where you know we've got the various different uh, theories as to what they could be you know we've got um, exactly yeah spoke about briefly we spoke about vampires uh faith paranormal folk. faith folk demons, demonic yeah alien aliens you know, yeah much like or, the black eyed children again the same yeah. sort of theories cropped up in explaining you know the women in black and in turn you know i guess to an extent the you know the men in black um mm. you know i mean the, he, the, the, the three could be you know the branches of the same you know, sort of group or organization, and they just take on different forms depending on where they've been, yeah. I don't know, recruited from, I suppose. Yeah. In, you know, in their yeah. appearance, you know, if you, if you, I know they're just films, but if you take the men in black films, you've got agents of the men in black from different planets, different races, sexes, creatures, you know, all sorts. There's no reason why, if these guys do exist, that they've not done the same thing, that they but, are yeah, taking on different forms based on their purpose or, or, you know, for their mission or their intent. Well, if we do take into uh, Bender's account, you know, he, he describes yeah. something that is very much along, like it's true form, very much along the same sort of lines as the Flatwoods monster, which is why exactly, we got into yeah. that episode. Which is how we got you there. Know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so it the, offers up again. I think so that's, many... that's quite a nice, uh, nice little theory that it is something along those sort of lines, maybe not quite as, Hollywood and fluffy, and you know they're not necessarily here to protect us, but no. they're far here more to... sinister intentions. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of sinister, sinister intentions, I very much I don't want to say I like the idea of it, but the theory that I find more compelling mm. is the idea that these abductions and creatures, and um, when I say creatures, women in black, men in black. The idea is that they're trying to create human hybrids human yes. alien hybrids and that would explain the phantom social workers or the bogus social workers as as nick yes. Riffen refers to them that might explain their their intensive yeah um but there's also plenty of stories with regards to abductees that you know it's not just um we've had surgery done on them where you know mm. there's scarring on the ovaries or scarring on the testicles or whatever yeah is also there's actual accounts of you know jumping on the good foot and doing the bad thing yeah you know there Sexual is that that actually happened absolutely there, yeah. you no, know, there is so, absolutely and that's that does kind of tie in you know, to some of the, like you say, with the phantom well, does tie into... workers and the Aura Reigns thing, if you if you choose to yeah. believe that, you know, that she was sent... And Truman's to... one as well, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that, you know, that she was sent to, you know, intimidate, you know, men, find out, you know, sort of information, you know, if the, you know, sexual element of their encounter is yeah. true, then is that, again, because she's, you know, been sent to kind of repopulate, um, you know, her own, you know, species with alien human you know sort of hybrid you've got the women mm. posing as the phantom social workers you know were they literally just stealing you know babies because they were struggling to reproduce their own you know their own you know race so yeah you know, the men in black had the intention of finding out more information and trying to silence us you know whereas the women in, in black had you know other objectives objectives which was to you know kind of kill and kidnap or you know, intimidate us where they could to, you know, mm. to weaken us, 
and also uses to you know kind of repopulate yeah so i guess that um so, that brings us to getting off the fence it does so, it does um how are we get how are we getting off the fence well i guess you've well, so, i guess you've kind of alluded to yours sort of already so you can you can you can kind of elaborate on that i guess more but yeah yeah i suppose where i'm going is probably to kind of keep in tow with you know the men in black and you're more so the men in black i guess where, whereby they are a, a kind of an alien i suppose more of an alien race with maybe shape-shifting capabilities which is where the gargoyle banshee type you know, mm. demonic presence, you know, comes from, because they do take on a very humanoid, um, you know, appearance with the, you know, with the, I guess what is believed to be the artificial skin, you know, the same skin tone as what we've seen in other men in black in, and women in black encounters, you know, yeah. the same attire, you know, the, the shoddy, you know, kind of wigs, the ov- oversized clothing, you know, wearing it in odd climates, um, you know, popping mm. up in all so dressing of, for the weather. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Odd, yeah. you know, sort of language, which may or may not be representative of that time period. So, yeah, I guess if I was to come off the fence, then, yeah, I'd say it would probably tie in more to the the kind of the men in black, um, you know, in, in, in it being of alien in in nature. But then, you know, if they don't, if it doesn't go their own way, the women mm. in black then send in the second artillery almost, but, but, but you know, the by cavalry way of the, sort of thing. Exactly. By way of these yeah. demonic banshee type sort of. So when you say stones. alien, so all of this is very yeah. alien, but we might need to make the distinction of, is it extraterrestrial or is it so, ultra terrestrial? Yeah. I, I would stick with extraterrestrial. I think for now, I think along the same lines as, you know, men in black, they're from other planets or a distant planet. They've got a sole mm. purpose, um, but they're not quite skilled in executing said purpose. And so that's why they look very awkward, carry a very distinct appearance. Um, you know, they're odd questioning, you know, how they carry themselves. It all, it all kind of, you know, all kind of ties in. But I, I think I, th- I think you've got to go down the, the sort of the demonic slash extraterrestrial kind of route i think but when you when you take Mm. into account the appearances the encounters you know what happens to these people afterwards um you know i think without getting too fantastical i think you could end up going down any route like we've mentioned with vampires you know fey folk you know paranormal Mm. which i i think it's less on that side of things well this is where my my thoughts come that's where i'd kind of go i i'm kind of jump in between the two different theories on it and kind of Mm. merging them together a little bit Mm. i think they're ultra terrestrial but they're also interdimensional now okay yeah this is this is why my thinking around it so have you seen the example of the 2d world being interacted with a three-dimensional object so the idea you've mentioned it before you know yeah when when we've uh, talked uh, you know yeah, the my, podcast, my boy yeah. started talking about it. Yeah, and yeah you mentioned kind of getting it. Yeah, freaked sure. out about it. That's right. So, um, yeah. what I believe is that we are, I think we're fourth dimensional beings. I think that's right. the way that we work. We work on four dimensions um, in the way that we live our lives, the realms that we live in, etc. Now, I believe that these creatures are five or more dimension dimensional beings. And that they can interact with us and they can uh, observe us they can yeah. notice our behaviors they can watch us all times right. and then they choose when they interact with us and when they interact with us mm-hmm. it's slightly different so i'll use that 2d for anyone that doesn't know this particular example it's a 2d world so you've got height and width that's it and you've got creatures that live in this world now if you take say something like a cylinder and you put that cylinder into that world say lengthways first then to those that 2d world is going to appear as a circle yeah now if you take it out and put it in width width ways first 
then it's going to appear as a rectangle. So it's still the same object in this three dimensional form, but in this 2D world, it appears in very different, very different ways. That's right. And I believe that's a very similar sort of thing as to what we experience with these creatures is yeah. that we may experience them as fey folk. We may experience them as extraterrestrials, so these flying yeah. saucers, these UFOs up in the air. They are ways in which these interdimensional beings that yeah. live on a plane that is far superior mm. to ours. When I say superior, there's multiple more dimensions than I what we can work. exist in. Yeah. And when they interact with our realm, our plane, mm. that they appear in these various different ways and forms. And yeah, I guess that ties into the Bigfoot theory that that I've got or that we've got, where they're mm. interdimensional and that they they take a very different form, but they present themselves in the form in which we are kind of used to or that we've fabricated ourselves because we couldn't uh process i think form that kind of thing but i think sometimes they don't have control over it that's why when they do yeah. appear to us in these various different forms that's why like the men in black always look off because mm. they can't really control a hundred percent as to what How they, they appear to us up. like yeah. you know there's always punching an idea about... but they don't know how it will turn out sort of thing yeah 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 pretty much and that's yeah. what i think the things like bigfoot is as well that it's that sort of that same thing that they're appearing this thing this creature this entity might be appearing yeah. or manifesting itself in the material realm let's call this that yeah um, that we live in the material realm that it thinks that okay well this is how i've got to interact and then it doesn't actually interact that way yeah um and i think that's what I think the men in black and the women in black are two very different things, mm. but they appear in very similar ways. Yeah, and same with the black eyed children. I mean, I know that I said in the previous episode that I think this I'm going more down the sort of fey folk sort mm. of way with the with the children in black. That's it. And since you know, looking at the women in black, mm. uh, the black eyed children, even then, and since going down the women in black sort of route, I do believe that it's more of an interdimensional sort of thing that they don't necessarily have control over okay. how they appear to us and how they interact with us. That's why sometimes, like for instance, Bruce Lee's interaction, mm. that he went and spoke to them and they kind of looked at each other, looked at him and didn't interact because yeah. maybe they hadn't, hadn't programmed banked on him yeah. talking English. You know, yeah. maybe they had banked on him talking telepathically, like mm. maybe they would. Um, yeah. I mean, there's... they hadn't pre programmed their response or their questioning to know what they were going to say. Yeah, that's pretty much where I'm landing on. Is that yeah, they're that makes sense. interdimensional beings that are ultra terrestrial. So they are here, they've always been here, mm. but we can't interact with them. At our as freely as we would like to only yeah. on them it's, it's very on much on their terms. terms yeah i mean that could work as well i could be on board with that I mean, especially with how they just appear and disappear just as quickly their appearance is always off yeah never quite a you know a sign of the times or a reflection of the period in which they're in and, and you know we know from the encounters we've gone over you know on in this episode that there's probably a good hundred year span at least just of what mm. we've covered of, there's, of there's where they can turn be... up fascinated by us as well this is yeah exactly so you know yeah and yeah different parts of the you know sort of the, the, the planet and stuff so yeah I, I could i could yeah sort of buy into buy into that one as well um so yeah, it's just good again that we've got two fairly different kind of theories um, yeah although they do i suppose ultimately go full circle with one another anyway in uh in some shape I or think... form We'll certainly be crossing uh, that red string over each other's boards. That's yes, that's for yeah. sure. We'll be, we'll be coming back to these points again <laughs> in the uh, not too distant future. I am sure of that. <laughs> Absolutely, and yeah. uh, we'd actually really like to hear what side of the fence you guys fall on. Um, yeah, do you so think it's all touch. nonsense? Do you think it's just yeah one? Is it just one group? Is it just men in black, or is it just women in black, or do they deliberately take on these different forms, or? Yeah, or is it like what you theory. said? Uh, is it like a consortium of yeah, different exactly. species yeah. that, you know, there's branches of men in black 
yeah. dotted all over the galaxy. Exactly, yeah. Um, going Each around stopping, uh, stopping intergalactic hanky-panky. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> um, we've not really come, to, you know, we've not really covered any of the particular theories other than to attribute them to the particular topic that we're sort of talking mm. about. So do you guys think that they are you know fey folk are they demonic are they paranormal are they extraterrestrial um you know ultra terrestrial um you know sort of let us know or do you think it's yeah. utter nonsense and you don't, you or, don't believe any of it's true and absolutely if so you know sort of why um but it's always worthwhile doing what we did and getting on nick redfern's book the women in black yeah precisely um, i mean there were literally hundreds very of, good read hundreds of encounters that he goes over in the in the book some you know longer some short some are very brief down to a literal you know sighting you know in a in a woodland area or whatever so yeah if you want to deep dive into any of them then yeah uh, pick up uh, his book i think it's called women in black the the mysterious companions of the men in black the creepy I, I think it's, creepy uh, companions of the, the men in black yeah. um yeah. so we listen to the audio book but there obviously is the paperback uh, available and yeah if you want to deep dive into any of the ones that we've gone over then uh, feel free to do so and we'd like to mm. kind of hear your hear your theories get in touch, but, um, get in touch think, on the as, socials uh, as always it's at that point where we uh talk about what we're going to cover what we're going to cover next yes, out of all of yeah. that <laughs> so uh our next episode um and we've we've mentioned it a couple times so far in this episode yeah, we've, um, we've both seen quite we're both quite happy to go with this, but it's the legend yeah. of the Banshee. Yes. That screaming harbinger of death. Yes, absolutely. That plagues Celtic uh, and yeah. Irish. Yeah, and Welsh. So, yeah, so yeah was, uh, there's plenty of stories, plenty of creatures that resemble the legend of the Banshee. So we're going to mm. be looking at those, seeing if we could tie them all together. And, yeah. uh, and uh, that's, that's going to be our next see episode. See if we find so, any see if we find any more synchronicities between them and other cryptids that we've already that we've already covered um, so I, think, brings us I, full think we'll find, I think we'll find i think we will i think yeah. we, i think we definitely will in uh in some uh in some form but no, i'm looking forward to yeah. diving into that one and and seeing what we can uh seeing what we can uncover yeah so but before we do go i do want to say thanks again to james for sending over his story to me yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Great right. bit of content that mate. Much appreciated. Really? Yeah. And if you again, if you guys have any sort of stories that you want to uh yeah. share with us, then if any feedback that for us, any sort of reviews, absolutely. shout outs, anything that you want to kind of send in to us, it's uh cryptid ramblers podcast at hotmail.com. Um absolutely. and hit us up and we'd uh you know we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. So again, thanks for everyone that's listened. Thank you. And continue to like and share our social podcasts, um, yeah, and uh, for continuing to support us. And yeah, remember, I appreciate it. Remember, stay classy, West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs>